Thank well, you. we're fortunate to welcome a new member, Dr. Anna Cooperian, to SRP. We made the rounds and met people. Um, I would ask you for a speech, how you intend to come to dominate the control of the SRP. <laughs> and we'll skip that. So with that, um, we adopt the agenda. Just have a secretary put the agenda up on the screen, please. How's everybody's vision? It's <laughs> not too focused. It's like it's going in and out or something. Just me. We might need a bit of tech support um, just because it's not focused in here. <clears throat> so it's not just me that it's blurry. Yeah. Okay, good. No, it's like, yeah. yeah. It's not... My eyes water. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. So normally, um, this would be our meeting that's focused more on stock assessment, whereas our June meeting is more research. So what we'll we'll do here is go over uh, things that have to do with stock assessment, the MSE, and the scientific research program. Things that come up, larger issues that need further work. We get requested for June. So yeah, we have a group agenda. We can get started on agenda item three. Okay. Um, so just as a, a quick reminder, um, and again, welcome, Anna. Is that Anna or Hannah or how do you? Anna. Anna. With two heads. Two heads. <laughs> not not Anna. <laughs> no problem. Um, so I guess particularly for your own benefit, the way we sort of run the SRB meetings and how they flow into the commission meeting is that we have two SRB meetings each year. And the first is really for the SRB to provide um, guidance and potential redirection to the secretariat. Um, and so most of the recommendations that come out of the report are generally requests for additional model runs or uh, different data collection or analyses to be to be undertaken and then this meeting the september meeting is specifically dark designed to review everything we have again to provide some redirection and, and potential calibration of what we're doing um, and maybe a bit of a reality check and see in some cases but then to provide clear advice in the form of recommendations to the board to the commission uh, and they will review that um, as soon as the meeting's done but also with the interim meeting which is held at the end of november start of december this year uh and then finally as they make any any final decisions or actions at the commission meeting which happens at the end of january next year so that's it in sort of general process of the flow of work um there is the opportunity for the research advisory board who's the industry portion um of the science review component they meet late november which is 28th of november 28th. 28th of november just for one day um, uh, and they look at more of the operational side of what we're doing and how really feasible it is on, on water um, and so typically that information will also feed into the srb um, on an annual basis um, that's sort of it you know in a process level we will meet all day today tomorrow and half a day on Wednesday, I think it is what's currently planned. Um, and in terms of drafting, so at the end of each day, we exit the room, the secretary exits the room and the board just talks. Uh, it comes up with any uh, draft recommendations that you want to come back to us with. Um, and then we'll adopt that report on Wednesday morning. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, in terms of the SRB's terms of reference, I think we've already sent that to you so you're familiar with what the board does overall. Just drop that into the report just as a reminder for anyone else picking up the report, just to find out what, what the SRB actually does. And it's just a reminder um, of, the, of that process cycle. So we'll, we'll drop that into the report as well. 
Uh, then we jump into agenda item 3.2, which is an update on the actions arising. And so if we could just have paper 03 brought up, please. Well, that's happening. Um, I noticed a new agenda item here, management supporting information. So that, I think we actually had it on the agenda last time, but we didn't have anything in there. Um, it is the additional component of the five-year research plan. We have the three core areas. One of the uh, sort of core research, which covers everything that Giuseppe does, in terms of biology and ecology, the stock assessment, the MSC work. Um, and then we have the monitoring side of things, and that's both fishery dependent and fishery independent. So uh, satellite surveys, as well as the data collection we're doing in the field at various ports and aging commercial samples, for example. And then the additional component in the five-year plan is all about those additional ad hoc requests that the commission often asks us for, uh, analysis of size limits and things like that, which don't fit into our or research or monitoring activities, but there are just sort of <coughs> ad hoc requests that periodically can come, come around um, and we'll provide additional research or analysis. Some of that is also related to the fishery regulations that the Busher leads. Um, and again, that also feeds through just as a, the exact same example, the size limit analysis, which would have resulted in modification of fishery regulations. So that's what's that, that, that's about. Yeah, um, the report, the SRB report from 22, the last meeting, there was a, um, a recommendation under management supporting information. That was the one related to the MSC to examine FIS scenarios. Oh. So uh, the MSC includes some scenarios in which the FIS has skipped, that, that sort of stuff. So, and it was put into there as sort of like, oh, this is something that the commission might want to hear as sort of a general more supporting Long summer. Yes. Okay. Um, and so jumping on to paper 03, this is just where, uh, and again, more of an update for you, uh, Anna, in terms of each meeting of the scientific review board, we'll put up the various actions that arose from the previous meeting um, and, and provide a sort of a, either a short update if there are updates that aren't already included in other papers that you're going to review over the next couple of days. And most of them are. Most of them are either stock assessment modifications, and so Ian will, will talk about those in details, or um, components for the MSC or the biological and ecosystem science research. And, and so you'll get those updates. Um, in terms of the paper itself with these specific actions, we try and make sure that there's a specific deliverable within each recommendation or request. Um, an indication of who's going to undertake the work. Sometimes it's the secretariat, sometimes it's contracting parties, uh, and then also a time frame. And so, if, <coughs> this is going to let me scroll. Very responsive, Rob. I don't know if you're listening. I'm not getting response. So Appendix A um, is broken into two components. One is the recommendations for the last meeting, and then the requests. And it comes in a number of forms. Um, obviously, the number of the recommendation, what paragraph it was linked to the last report, uh, the last SRB meeting, the precise text, and then any quick update. Uh, and so whether it's just an ongoing task, and if there is um, paper associated with this meeting, what that paper number is so that you can refer to it quickly and easily. Um, I don't intend on stepping through them, and primarily because I think there was <coughs> one of the recommendations that came out of the last meeting. 19, 20, 22 recommendations and about half a dozen requests. So I don't intend on going through them, but I will pause to see if the board has had a chance to review the paper uh, and would like some additional feedback on any of those actions arising that's not already covered in the other papers. So maybe I'll just stop there one by one. Kim, a lot of them uh, were related to requests or recommendations from yourself. And so just if there is anything you want to ask specifically at this point, or you're happy to wait till the papers are presented. 
Um, one thing that I would mention, and I've already sent uh, Andy, Josep, um, uh, Olaf, and Sean uh, an email this morning was there was a misstatement in SRB recommendation 10, paragraph 36. Um, and um, there was some uh, narrative devoted by the Secretariat to addressing uh, that comment, um, which was which was uh, it would basically it it it, it basically suggested that uh, other measures be taken to ex it should have said exclude non autosomal i.e. mitochondrial DNA and it said include. Uh, it was out of context because the rest of the paragraph was talking about excluding data, but um, uh, there was an error in transcribing that in the report. Maybe we fixed it. Maybe we fixed it. Can't see it. Where is it? About the fifth line from the bottom. Yeah. Oh, right. okay. Perfect. Okay. Right, I'm going to make a note of that one and correct it. Is there anything that's not um, provided in paper 08 that addresses that, do you think? Um, again, uh, there was um, uh, some pushback um, uh, on the, the comment and, and and reasoning why um, they should be excluded and not included. But again, um, those comments were rightly pointed out and uh, it was in response to the misstatement in the, uh, in the recommendation. But um, yes, I think that there were a number of other recommendations that were associated with the ongoing genomics work and uh, generally um, I thought that uh, the um, I'm, I'm assuming it was Andy that put it together did a nice job in responding and uh, I provided some other comments earlier today um, in my email that will probably portion of which will end up in the uh, in the SRB report okay. right right thank you very much thank you very much. Um, anyone else? Anyone, anyone else have any? Other? I just have to mute. I just have to mute. Um, any other questions or comments on the actions arising? Noting that you can come back to this at any point over the next few days. Okay. Then let's jump on briefly to paper 04, and this will be a very brief recap, as it's the same paper that was provided at the last SRB meeting. Uh, and this is just uh, the outcomes of the 99th session of the IPHC annual meeting held in January of this year. Uh, and so, uh, Anna, again, this is just something that we provide for a quick, easy reference throughout the course of the SRB meetings so that you don't actually have to go back and dig through the, the commission report. Um, so you can see the various components that were discussed, various topics that were discussed by the commission at its most recent um, annual meeting, uh, and then the outcomes of the meeting are provided at the epic site. It's the same format uh, as we do for the SRB, so what the meeting is, the recommendation number, a link to the paragraph in the report of the commission, uh, and then precisely what the commission has decided for action or, or, or similar, or any particular topic. Uh, so again, I don't intend on going through those because most of them were taken into consideration at the last SRB and therefore incorporated into any recommendations or requests from that meeting to this meeting. But are there any any questions or comments? Not seeing any. Let me just. If we jump on then to the observer updates, I'm just quickly seeing we don't have either at the moment. We'll come back. So we'll reopen for agenda item 3.4 once we have our science advisors on board. Okay. All right, let's bring up paper five, which is the um, IPHC's five-year program of integrated research and monitoring. Okay. 
So this is just a, a quick update, noting that at the last SRB meeting, you made a number of requests to expand the um, updates table, the indicators table, which is provided at Appendix A of this paper. Um, so we haven't attached the full five-year pro, uh, program for update at this meeting. It's, it's, it's on the website and linked through the paper itself. But if you recall, you made a number of requests um, for expanding this table in terms of one of the overview of the research activities that are being undertaken. We did provide this to the commission um, recently at a special session, uh, sorry, at the work meeting. And um, they didn't provide any feedback in session, but they, they indicated that they wanted to spend some time looking at it to confirm that it's, that it's really what they're after. Um, and so they were questioning why the SRB was providing them. And again, it's because of the process you need to be able to track these these various projects as they're both proposed, but then also as they're delivered upon over time. Uh, and, and, and they recognize that and they just want a little bit more time to to have a think about it. Hopefully it will provide us some um, advice over the next couple of weeks before the interim meeting paper deadline comes up. Um, so, Secretary, if I could have you just put up information paper 01, which is this table from Appendix A, um, populated with the various biological and ecosystem science uh, activities. Now, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it will just give you uh, an idea, of, uh, I guess, what it looks like when it is populated. So hold for a moment. So information paper 01, it's the Excel spreadsheet, please. While that's, that's coming up, um, it's probably going to be easier anyway on your own screens if you do open it, it's not going to be too visible. Um, if you have had a chance to read it, are you able to comment or willing to comment at this point, maybe later in the meeting? If if it's comprehensive enough with the, the additional columns that you requested at the last meeting, is, and, and so in short, is it providing enough information for you to um, both track, but then also comment on various research activities, monitoring activities that were secretariat's undertaking um, and whether they're meeting their goals, objectives. Should just be the final one. Not yours, it's not coming. Anything else? Just try it from the website as well. Obviously. How is that one? Okay. So it's the information paper over at the bottom. So as you can, uh, it's gone from the screen again. So as you can see, there's a lot of information that's been requested. Um, it's the secretary is certainly taking uh, a little bit of license in terms of how much detail we're providing um, because it will become more and more ungainly or unwieldy uh, if we do try and populate it with great detail, any more detail than this. So if you haven't ha already had a chance, uh, obviously Giuseppe's going to speak to his research activities um, later today or tomorrow. If you could just ensure that you do review this table, this Excel spreadsheet, compare it against what's presented, uh, and then provide some commentary, particularly for the commission, about whether you now feel that this is sufficient, both for your needs, but then also potentially for the commission, commission's needs to be able to evaluate the various projects. And, um, everything from the core, subject or objectives of the project, if there's been any publications or any any working papers presented to the Commission subsidiary bodies, what the performance period is, and then also uh, where the funds are coming from. And, and the Commission is particularly interested in how each of the projects relates to the core mandate of the Commission, any ongoing directives that the Commission may make, but then also in terms of overall budgeting. Yeah, so I'll, I'll pause there. That's a lot of information to review. Uh, and so if, if you haven't already, just over the next day or two, you spend some time reviewing that and, and 
provide some guidance to the commission. I thought this was a, a great improvement, in, in particular the specific inputs into management. Really helpful. This seems to target something that we've been talking about a lot over the last couple of years. Each of the projects um, quite specifically linked to a, a management decision there. So it was really helpful. Kim, in particular, noting that a, a lot of these as well were um, projects that are related to, to your field of expertise. Uh, any initial thoughts or just want to provide some additional written comments? Uh, none at this time. I haven't really given it uh, a full look, but I certainly will in the next day or so. Fantastic. Fantastic. <clears throat> Where do these priority ranks come? I think someone would ask. <laughs> so that also came up at the work meeting about how the priorities are arrived upon. Um, Giuseppe, they, they specifically asked for us to come up with an explanation of the priorities, didn't they? Can you recall what they're seeking um, mm -hmm. against what the priorities are in the table? Yeah, so this, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, this was raised uh, uh, by the commissioners recently in our meeting. Uh, and uh, in fact, the prioritization, the justification for that prioritization can be found in the five year program of monitoring. And specifically, there's a series of tables that uh, are also included in the documentation for this meeting for the biological and system science program. So that's document eight taken at the end there's a few appendices where um you can see the and i'll, I'll present that later today and I'll, I'll provide just a summary of, of how we came up with those uh, prioritizations but those are based on the uh suggested research items uh in terms of priority based for based on stock assessment and management strategy evaluation needs uh, so there was an exercise uh, that the commission, the secretariat in particular, has has taken over the last few years, uh, um, prompted by the SRB a few years ago, to really work, clarify, and make sure that all research activities are aligned with the of stock assessment and management strategy evaluation. So the justification and in, in the written justification can be found in the five-year program document, and uh, the specifics um, are found in those tables and I'll go through that later today. Maybe just for history, the we used to have a, a more broad list that was not prioritized and it was the SRB that recommended that we winnow down to the top three priorities, I think, mm -hmm. in each of the categories so that we could really focus on important items. And one of the um, additional benefits now of putting it in this table in particular is that quick reference guide or uh, review and verification process by the SRB mm -hmm. and also by the Commission itself. Uh, these, uh, as, as Giuseppe was pointing out, it's, it's these are the priorities that have come from the five-year plan as, as we see it based on the directives and requests that we're receiving. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for review, both from the SRB, but then also for the Commission to say, look, actually, we think you need to be moving this to a higher priority, given whatever issue may be coming to the Commission. So so while it's there, it, it's not set in stone. It's, it's what we're currently doing, um, how we prioritize the activities against the Commission directives. But this is a, uh, a new table, um, and it's and one of the reasons the Commission wants it is so they can review it. I think also one of the um, intentions for uh, this table was not just for the uh, research prioritization, but also to identify uh, the source of funding for the various projects, uh, internal versus external. So that was another consideration, and that's why we've added here a um, series of columns uh, regarding which are the funding sources, the period, the amounts received, uh, both for projects that are currently ongoing, as well as projects that we've proposed, uh, and that we've uh, some of which we have some uh, results uh, on the outcome, and some of which we are still waiting for.
Um, I just get a chance to have a read through the five year research plan. No, I there is a lot there, but and, and I think one of the aims of this table is to try and again make a quick reference guide for everybody so they know where we're at with various projects, what are the priorities, where the money's coming from, um, and we can meet it ourselves. Hopefully, it, it, it's the SRV will find it useful as well. Okay. Um, just, just more generally, is there any thought or responses from the SRB on the five-year research plan, noting that the commission in January will consider any uh, additional modifications or updates or um, to, to the five-year research plan? And we've been through it a few times now, so go through it specifically. Sure. What, what it's worth doing is, is partially to Basha just very quickly and just give a verbal um, update of where we're potentially headed with uh, AI. Sure. So what we've been doing, uh, obviously, the understanding the age structure of the population is very important. So what we're trying to do is to, to leverage the methods that are available. And uh, obviously, Giuseppe is looking into genetics method, but we also decided that it will be worth investigating whether using the image-based approach to estimating at the age of the civic childhood is, is it something that would give us uh, results that are sufficient for uh, as an input to things like stock assessment. So what we're looking is into um, using the approach that has already been developed for, for other species. There is a model called Deep Otolit that uses images of uh, otolits from um, human halibut as well as a red mullet and the scales from salmon. So they use pictures to train what, uh, what is called the convolutional neural network model. And we use that to estimate, uh, get the estimates of age. So what we're going to do is we are we're going to take some pictures of, of the ones that we have uh, already reached. Um, so if you didn't know, we have over one and a half million of age otolets in our archive. So we have a great resource to, to use as an input to this type of model. We just never took pictures of these. So what we're going to, we have now, we, we have a camera that is attached directly to the microscope and we'll be taking some pictures and adding them to the database and use that model that has been uh, just for a minor adaptation in order to, to train the model based on the civic public pictures versus the, the previously published uh, model for the species. So what we'll be looking into is much how, how well this would perform in terms of estimating age of the civic output. How many years this other type series covers? So we have autolets uh, from um, pretty much from uh, 1920s, mm. 1930. So they're pretty much uh, we've been collecting the findings from there. The organization was established. What we intend to do now, as a second first step, is to um, we started with uh, autolets from 2019 FIS survey, just because this is the last really large scale survey that covers all geographic locations of the IPAC convention waters. Because a lot of, you know, and like our understanding is that there's a geographical variation in terms of how the age is manifesting in the autolets, depending on where the autolets are coming from. So, what we start is that 2019 FIS survey and trying to get that uh, component uh, and see how well this kind of model will perform. And once we get this initial information out, trying to uh, see that what's the, the, the variation versus the human red age versus the, the AI-based age, uh, see where, where we need to go in terms of uh, adding the samples based on geographical areas and, and trying to figure out better what's the most appropriate training set. Uh, so so that, that's how, how we try to approach this, this idea of using images. Uh, obviously, once we, we use that uh, 2019 uh, 
exist. That's the, that can be just the beginning. There is a, definitely a potential for temporal variation. Also. So, so even if this approach would work, we would still plan to continue aging manually, just to not miss on any potential changes that occur over time. So obviously we, we, we are worried that how the age manifests problem is really changing over time over time to change environmental conditions. So that that's in a nutshell. Um, in terms of more modeling approach. But in general this is a it's a very standard uh, convolution net neural network model. It's it runs on Python and just uh, requires just a lot of pictures in order to, to get this kind of model trained. So and your links at capture also. Uh, yes, we have uh, at least for more recent uh, years we do have length. So the original deep autolet project it also uses uh, the pictures to estimate the, the length as well. Mm -hmm. So that's something we can look at. We also were wondering whether, for example, we could even try to train the model to recognize the sex of the specific cow. But we already have that information, so we can also train uh, train the model to, to try to recognize using AI whether the autolet can review the sex of the specific cow. But those are further stages. So it's really at the moment it's more of an exploratory. It's not really uh, whether the approach will work, because we know that this type of methodology is working. It's just whether how accurate it will be and whether it will be of a sufficient accuracy to, to in, incorporate in the stock assessment and how much of a training we need to do in order to for this to be sufficient. So we'll be continuously adding pictures and trying to figure out what's the improvement in terms of accuracy of those estimates. Is it being given length as a covariate to help predict or? So at the moment, we want to directly test the already available model. So that the model, that model actually, what it does is takes the pictures and estimates the length of the fish. So it's a, it's an outcome variable for, for the, for, 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 from their approach. What we've been thinking, it would be actually more interesting to add as a covariate the, the region from where the opal is coming from to help the estimate. So the way, so to have kind of additional information that is covered in where the opal was taken, as well as the time when it was taken. So maybe a year, reflecting in the cohort, as well as the time of the year when it was harvested, because we know that uh, the last rank is also manifesting differently throughout the season. So if you catch fish early in the season, it's, it, that last rank will look differently versus when, when you catch that fish later in the season. So those are the covariates that we think would be most uh, valuable in terms of adding them to, to the model. But that's something that we would uh, need a little bit more of a, um, expertise in order to fully adapt the model to 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 incorporate those variables at the moment as i said we we adapted the model that is open source available from other research project if we have indication that this is something that is worth further exploring that gives us at least some estimates that look like it might be promising then we'll be trying to add some modifications to the model to further improve the estimates. At least that's how, how I see this project forward. As I said, this is very exploratory at the moment. Uh, it's but definitely with the technology moving very rapidly, it's, it's very promising. So we don't want to kind of miss the, the the wave. So trying to to see what what we can do at this time and then. Uh, if that works well, that's definitely a really good way to, to supplement the, the current manual reading so that you can have this more of a hybrid approach where you have still some autolists that are read by human readers that are because we have to also keep in mind that this is a lot of training 
to, to have somebody to, to meet that bottle. It's trying to get that hybrid approach and supplement estimation of agents. The, the method's not um, explicitly identifying annually, right? It's, um, it's just using the neural network to. Yes. The, so there's no, no looking back at what, what the algorithm identified. It's just. Yes, so what we do, we do not uh, annotate the pictures. It's not like we really ask the model to explicitly identify the rings. We just provide the, pretty much the, the table. This is the, the picture path. This is the age. And the model is trying to figure out its own way how they identify their age patterns. And, and so one of the things that's come out of past um, image analysis of these uh, unsupervised image classifications is that um, sometimes it can be keying in on things that are totally separate from the information you're hoping to give it. So, for example, I don't know if this is credible, but if you're um, for the larger otoliths, if maybe the light settings are a bit different, it might be using light settings um, in its analysis. And I, there's one uh, um, example, and I think it's, I'm not sure if this is real or uh, just apocryphal, but uh, an image analysis um, program like this to identify uh, NATO versus um, Russian uh, um, army vehicles. And currently, it had like 99% classification accuracy. Mm -hmm. And then they realized they trained it on winter images from <laughs> Russia and summer images from NATO. So it couldn't actually distinguish them at all. It just knew if there was snow in the background. And so you have to be very, very careful when you're developing the images that there's, there's nothing different about the, the older ones. Anyway, yeah. So what we are trying to do, we we've been trying to to see what kind of backgrounds uh, are we can use uh, in order to not to have too many features in the background that might be kind of trying to push the training component of the model. So there are definitely various things that uh, you have to, but it's an, a really approach where you have to test a lot of things and see how they work. Reverse. It, it's hard to to know what could be the driver of this kind of it's really the deep learning gets really the kind of little bit of black box. You don't really necessarily know what are the specific features that are driving what's the age. But you have but what you can do is you just see the, the, the outcomes and, and compare it where, where you compare it with your kind of desired level of accuracy and see whether this is something that can be used in the stock assessment. It might be worth, because of that, that, that's both strength and uh, potential weakness, because of that it might be worth doing a cross-validation on an entirely independent set of images from you know, some, some other lab uh, and to asking whether it performs well on those. That, that way it wouldn't be keying in on something specific to the setup that's in this lab here. Yeah, so that meant at least this model has been already aged on the, some of the, so that's a... That's, uh, good start that it, it's been already used uh, as the and shown as a having a potential but yeah definitely we are looking for as if we have any indications uh from the early results that this is something that we could potentially move forward with as a more of a production stuff like it's more of an exploratory project we definitely will need any feedback in order before we, we use any or propose any implementations of the system that's in, in the other products. This is definitely applying those ages. It will be a, it will be a process where we will need to verify a lot of things. And uh, a lot of uh, research suggests that there might be a need for, again, a little bit also hybrid approach where, for example, it might perform very well up to a certain age and very old uh, bottle. It might be difficult to be doing the AI. And it's not necessary just because of the compression of those uh, um, rings, but it might be also because there's just less of uh, of those ages in the training data set. So really thinking about if there are indications that this, this could be a method that can be applied, really thinking, figuring out the more of those technical details, how, what's the best way to utilize that method for more process. And that could still be useful, right? I mean, it might be that the uh, human agers that have just focus on the, the larger fish, I'm assuming that they're probably older and probably more complex to age, yeah. and send all the smaller, the mm -hmm. from smaller fish to the AI. But the, the advantage is that at least 
it is a in a way it's a consistent method so what you can do it you can also consistently apply kind of approach for classification in a way of oh, these auto let's stay if they are sufficiently classified within age categories based on the AI model versus these are proposed as a as a as auto lets that should be going to the human leader. Mm -hmm. That's that's also something that can be applied but in a very consistent kind of straightforward ways like this is the model says these are older and suggested to be different by you know under microscope. Mm -hmm. So there, there are various kind of those technical details that can be really adapted to, to a species you're specifically interested in. And I guess this, this depends a lot, for example, how how old fish you, for example, expect to see in, in the data set. It might be different to, to for the species that uh, that original model was developed for versus specific how, but so really flesh out those details so if if that initial stage is promising. Have you tried stabilizing those? That so I know the manual aging of auto lit has been confirmed as unbiased based on the rate of the carbon the nuclear testing. So mm -hmm. that has, has been done in the past. Mm -hmm. Although obviously this is not, we are looking also for cost efficient. Yeah, habits. So I was just thinking because in many places in the documents it pops out the, mm -hmm. the structure of the mm -hmm. populations and the movement in these mm -hmm. different management areas is, is not very clear. Mm -hmm. So if there are, like what are are also oxide, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it could be oxygen on the light, the oxygen isotopes. But if there are differences, and at least differences within the depth, that, that would give an idea. Like we, we have done then, some work on stable isotopes, mostly as a form of a pilot project. But we, the concern was when we did that, this was at least a decade ago or more, uh, that the at the time, the precision of the lab analysis was such that we would send off two different batches of samples and not be able to reproduce the same kinds of results. So the conclusion was that we, any sort of discrimination would have to be done within a batch rather than across batches of samples, which is a little problematic uh, in terms of total numbers and expense. Um, and then the other issue is just the migratory aspect of these fish. So the, although there might be some fairly weak signals in the water and in baselines we really don't know the history of a particular fish so we can we can sample a fish in a certain place and that fish may have actually spent most of its life in a totally different area and so the decision at that time was that this wasn't wasn't really working out the the, the, the pilot work we did just didn't didn't look very promising at the time could be that the technology's improved to the point now where uh, it's worth another look I, I just recently heard from colleagues who work with freshwater pearl mussel that uh, they use this kind of nano saw and they take samples from the early growth area when the, the mussel or the fish is, is small, larvae juvenile, and, and then later. And they can see also how the use of nutrition, in this case, oxygen, so it's changes across the life so if they are in different kind of habitats so a range of projects that could be developed definitely based on that well yeah i mean speaking of range of projects if you, if, i mean if the goal is to you know supplement or aging have you guys been looking at epigenetic aging well, uh, in in table in the table that it's uh, information paper one, we have a proposal to Alaska Sea Grant that's specifically uh, addressing uh, aging through uh, genetic means uh, through the use of uh, epigenetics. So it's been shown in a number of G species that that the epigenetic patterns, so the DNA methylation patterns of genomic DNA, uh, are um, 
are related to age, and then you can model uh, the chronological age based on on the uh, epigenetic markings of the DNA. So we have a proposal in. Um, uh, we have uh, received the reviews; they're positive, but we don't have the outcome yet. So this was this would be a proposal that, that if funded would provide us with a graduate student and the funds to uh, look at uh, this technique. The, the advantage and the difference between this and other techniques that involve autoless AI, uh, the uh, near infrared uh, method, and the traditional aging is that you can do this with any tissue. Uh, and you know, kill the fish too. Exactly. Uh, so it's a non-lethal method that uh, can be used on samples that we already have. So we've been collecting fin clips. We have an extensive collect a collection of aged fin clips uh, that we've been using since 2017 to age fish through genetic methods. So we have all those fin clips with an age uh, as shaded with them. Uh, so uh, we have tremendous resources to work on that project if they fund it. We saw some spectacular results for Southern Bluefin last month. They put up a plot of age, like a otolith age against first cut DNA age. And it was it was pretty good. There was some scatter around the line. And they said, uh, and then we and then we used an AI. And they showed another plot where every single point was right on the line. We just eliminated the error. And the reason is the different methylation sites, there were like 20 methylation sites, and each one has its own methylation rate. So you actually end up fitting a model to individual methylation sites. Just it's unbelievable how accurate that thing was out there. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, the, uh, at least for, because that the, the uh, Bluefin tuna has not been published yet, at least to my knowledge. No, it's very um, but for the eight species that are that there's information, the, the mean uh, aging error is about 0 0.8, 0 0.9. It's actually fairly low. Uh, so it's it's a method that it's been it's been used in the past successfully. So uh, it'll be depending on our funding. Seriously, you can look at CCS too. It was uh, Cyro. <clears throat> Yeah, that, that raised a few hackles when the two plots came up. It was like, you know, we used an AI, and suddenly this thing was perfect. <laughs> you can't really do that, but it turns out you can't. Because... Okay. So that's probably more time than we had budgeted for this. Well, we, we have extra time in the kit, <laughs> so I'm not at all concerned. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of opportunity, not just for aging, but for, for other things as well. So certainly for the June um, SRB meeting, I shall put something together as a bit of an update of where we're at. And then the intention will be to add that to the five-year plan. It's looking remotely positive. I think it will. So go ahead. I just uh, add that the Atlantic halibut people are also using genetic means of uh, aging fish because they don't have the access to the otolith information. So that's ongoing right now. Okay. Well, that's that's all we have just for the, the five-year plan. Quick update on where we're at with things. Um, we then jump into research, monitoring, etc. But before we do that, we do have um, Anne-Marie and Kurt with us. So. Anne Marie, do you, are you available? Is your microphone active? That you can just give us a bit of an update from your perspective, uh, what you'd like to see from the SRB this meeting? Morning. Sorry about that. Always takes a little bit of time finding the right button. Sorry, you're a little muffled there, Anne Marie. We can hear you, but it's just a little bit muffled. If you can try again. Oh, how's this? Very quiet. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, let me see if I can. 
I increase the volume on my own computer, is that actually talker on the other side? All right, let me try a different speaker. Okay, if I use this speaker. Still not great. No, I I download the so the Deep Autolet project uh, has uh, published the code on GitHub. So I'm just uh, using direct the uh, the code to so the the, the <coughs> my interface is only to if you put a picture, you can try to figure out whether the same model gives you a estimate. So we we tested whether Pacific Output could give any estimate based on the green and hollow by the train model, but that does not work. So, but uh, what we do, we, we downloaded that uh, original code and adapted the code uh, to, to train the model, but uh, it's, it, it is a process to take a solution on the pictures. We'll literally just start it like, it's like, oh, yeah. it's on the, I just, I've, I've been trying to, you know, get some results, but uh, it, it does require substantial amount of features uh, depending on how many each computers you have in, in the data set. But uh, as we continue taking those pictures, uh, we will train the model the And then as I said, there's a definitely a big potential in terms of adding these pop variants, but that's something that requires a different Sorry, Emory, can you try again? Um, how does that work? That's better. Yeah. Ah, all right. No idea what happened there, but <laughs> while we're at it. Um, you, good you, morning, everybody. Yeah, you might just have to try and speak speak up a little bit as though you're yelling at us. Am I actually yelling? Or is that no, it's not, not good. No, right no. Okay, uh, let me go find another set of headphones and I will pop back in in a bit. It, it, it comes in and out. Sometimes it's really good. Sometimes it's just where it is relative to where you're talking. Oh, weird. Okay, well, while you do that, um, Kurt, I don't know if you have anything in particular you wanted to communicate from the U.S. side, um, noting Pete's not able to attend the meeting today. Hi, David. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, no problem at all. Okay, good. Yes, and, and that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm just filling in for Pete. He can't be here this week, and uh, so I'll be absorbing what I can to report back to him and, and the commissioners, too. Um, I, I'll try not to belabor people with my many, many questions. I'll probably scribble, scribble them down and, and uh, get back to you. Uh, when we're not in session, if I have anything particular I need. Okay. All right. All right. Well, while we await Anne Marie to come back, um, do you want to take a short break or should we just jump into uh, 4.11, the stock assessment? What's your preference? How long do you need, Ian? It's fairly short. I think it would be well under the, how long we had scheduled, but I only have 16 slides, so it should be a fairly short presentation. We only had two substantive requests from June, with recommendations, and I have a little bit of preliminary stuff to do as well. But that's it. Plenty of time to finish my lunch if we want to take a break. Is this one working? Oh, oh. <laughs> you're back. Okay. Like, try again. <laughs> Did that work? Or is it, how is it yeah, working? still not great, though. Okay. I don't like to Are you going to try again, Emery, or should we move on? 
Um, why don't you go move on? I will actually see if I can uh, log on on my phone. This sounds perfect right now. So if you yeah, want to just was, keep going. That was pretty good. <laughs> okay. I will not move and see if this works. <laughs> <laughs> Morning. Um, so I think there's three main things that sort of I've heard from our uh, commissioners. Uh, you guys have actually covered one of them in the last uh, discussion in terms of Um, for some of the work that we're doing. Yeah, we can't hear you again. Ah, it's going, it's waving in and out. I don't know if you're sitting still or just your. I will try not to wave my hands about, which is my typical. Is this? Yeah, we're not, we're not getting anything now. to uh, log in on my phone in a bit. Okay, and, try that. Okay. Yeah, so you want to take 10, min 10 minutes? Let's do that. So for everybody else listening, we're just going to take a quick 10 minute break and see if we can rectify the, the sound issue with Anne-Marie. So um, just hold tight. We'll come back in 10 minutes. So 10 past 10. Um, good morning, everyone. Sorry, um, I was late. I was taking the agenda at the 9.30 start time. Um, so I have three things that uh, came up around, uh, during the, mostly around during the meeting that we had a couple of weeks ago with the commissioners. Um, the first one you guys have already pretty much covered in terms of the discussion around um, AI. And so one of the commissioners was asking about, can we take advantage of recent advances in, in a, AI? Um, so I think you guys have, talked about some of that already. Um, the second one is um, around climate change and a question around how well positioned are we about our ability to detect and predict the effect of climate change on halibut. Um, I think a follow up to that one might be um, like what might that look like with respect to what gets put in front of the commissioners. So figures, tables, modifying existing figures, tables versus some sort of narrative approach. I think that's something to kind of Think about um, along with the technical, what can we, what can we do? Um, the third one, uh, you guys have already heard this in June, but it has, uh, you know, surprisingly not changed in terms of uh, fist design considerations and the process. So, uh, one of the main concerns, uh, the immediate concern, of course, is what's going to happen for 2024 um, in terms of a short-term decision. How useful is a severely truncated survey from a scientific perspective? Um, I think they're well aware of the economic side of things, but I think also thinking longer term um, is what can we do longer term around being uh, economically feasible and sustainable as well as uh, having a scientifically defensible this design. And I think underlying some of the questions I've been getting, it seems like one of the things as well that we seem to be spending a lot of time um, discussing different fist designs and is the commissioner's process um, like if there's a way to reduce the amount of time that they spend on an annual basis I think that would be appreciated um, yeah so those are the three things um, I have a personal request in terms of Kurt being here because Pete isn't able to, not that I don't appreciate Kurt being here, but um, can we request that Halibut Commission staff inform science advisors when the SRB dates change from those that are posted at the annual meeting? Um, I know that it's updated on the website, but we have to go and check and sometimes um, that is uh, well after the decision has been made to make a, make a change. So. Early notice is helpful for um, for our plans. Thank you. Question at the end. It sounded like there was a question to her. No, it's um, just that um, she didn't realize that the other day said she One question I have, Anne Marie, just based on, on, on what you were indicating. Um, you, you mentioned that the Canadian commissioners were keen to try and reduce the amount of time that they spend on determining um, this design. Is that what I heard? 
I think I'm just sort of reading into like wondering about the amount of time, like the amount of decisions is being made by the commissioners when it is um, fundamentally uh, like a scientific survey. So I think there, I'm sort of reading a little bit between the lines in terms of a concern in terms of how much additional layers are being put on top. Mind you, I could definitely be put, putting words into people's mouths. So take that with a grain of salt. The, the only thing I can think of which in that regard is, yes, the, the FIS used to be, or maybe not used to be, but for, for quite some time was purely science driven. Uh, and that was because we had a lot of um, additional financial backing to undertake the, the survey. Mm. But with the change in um, the fishery, the, the abundance, the fish price and, and other things since um, probably the first year of COVID, um, it's become more of an issue for them to weigh in on the design, noting those those other uh, secondary, uh, primarily the secondary objectives of the FIS, and that's to maintain long-term revenue neutrality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so in a way that the science is there, but now they need to be making decisions um, in terms of the financial backing of the survey. And, and I think that's where at least part of the additional time that they're undertaking um, and certainly at their, at their request. Um, I, I think there's also a component as well of <coughs> commissioners come and go and then some commissioners are more interested in, in getting into the nuts and bolts and, and pushing particular design modifications um, for a particular regulatory area or bioregion. And so that definitely fluctuates just depending on the commissioners that are um, on the board, so to speak. That, that's all I can I can think of. Thanks, Dave. All right. Uh, well, we can probably move on then, Chair. So we can move on to four point one, particular the research. We have the three core topics there: the stock assessment, MSE, and then biology and ecology. And so the, the first paper uh, is by Dr. Stewart. So if we could have the presentation up, please. Um, which one is it? So 06, the PowerPoint for paper 06, please. I can actually take oh, it right here. I'm not going to work with it. Excellent. <clears throat> sure, I'm live. Well, thanks. Good morning. Um, as you'll recall from Dave's introduction, uh, we have sort of a two-part process. So in June, I'm usually responding to a breadth of research recommendations that you've made from the previous year. Usually the spring is the time when I get to dig into some of the non-tactical uh, issues a little bit more and really do more analysis. Uh, you'll recall that we, we had a discussion about model weighting several other topics that we've been working on for a number of years in June. And so there actually weren't a lot of recommendations coming out of the June meeting this year. From this meeting moving forward, um, this is where I provide responses to the requests and recommendations from the June meeting. And then this is really our last chance to check in because after this point, I don't make any additional changes to the model structure or the basic data components of the assessment. We basically go into production mode um, and I, I may have a little more on it in the presentation, but in terms of timeline, we finalize the data sets at the end of October, and then I have approximately 10 to 14 days to finish the assessment. So really things need to be locked and loaded and ready to go. And I just put the, put the passengers in the car and close the doors and we're off to the races. And uh, although there is some chance that something unexpected could happen, our experience over the last decade is that that has Generally, the data sets play pretty nicely with the Talbot stock assessment. Um, and so that would be the plan again going forward for this year. So what I'll provide you is an update to um, the process as well as a response to the recommendations uh, from the previous meeting. So you'll recall that we are in an update year. 
last year was a full stock assessment. Full stock assessment being my opportunity, our opportunity to break everything down, to look at all the individual data sources, all the model structural components, how the ensemble goes together, model weighting, everything is on the table in a full assessment year. Uh, we did that. We made some important changes and improvements in, in 2022. And this year, the expectation is that we wouldn't make major changes to the model or data structure, um, but we could, of course, investigate things. And we have, in update years, we have made changes, um, but we've made them in a, a somewhat more um, stepwise and conservative way. Generally, we would only make a big change in an update year if, A, it seemed really necessary, or B, it was a big change maybe in concept, but in, in the results it didn't, didn't have such a big effect. Um, so following our approximately three-year schedule, which we've now, I think, finally aligned with the MSE schedule as well, we conduct a full stock assessment in one year. The following year is an update for the assessment, and it's a chance for the MSE operating models to catch up to any developments in the stock assessment. Then we have one year where neither of the two things change, and we can just focus on results. So that will be 2024 next year. And then we go back into a full stock assessment year, make any changes we need to make there, followed by another full MSE year. So we are effectively on a three-year cycle for both, with them just one year out of phase in order for the MSE operating models to be able to respond to any necessary updates to data or structural changes in the stock assessment. So, and I think this is really the first year we've finally gotten on this perfectly aligned schedule, which Alan and I feel like this is this is the right schedule terms of keeping the two things current, but not updating everything every year such that nobody can keep track of all the new developments and, and we're always out of sync. So you had two requests, or sorry, you had one request and one recommendation from June. The first was a follow-up to the ongoing investigation of whale depredation that we've been doing. Um, and so I will be providing you some more detail on that. Uh, note that everything in this presentation is just a summary of what's already in the document. Um, so if you want to dig into more detail at your leisure, it's in the document. Um, and then the recommendation, which was made in June, but probably worth uh, reiterating in this meeting, um, even though I'll, I'll, of course, follow that recommendation from June. Uh, the recommendation was based on our investigation of model uh, predictive performance to not try to transition to some more fancy dynamic approach to model weighting, but to stick with equal weighting um, for the four model ensemble, at least for another year. So you see these the performance and, and other things play out over time. So I'll give you, I, I'll also give you a quick update on that, although I don't really have anything new on that topic. So getting right into the depredation. So you'll recall that I had access to um, logbook information from all regulatory areas, and I had done a fairly extensive preliminary analysis of the uh, encounter rates of uh, the reported encounter rates of marine mammals, particularly orca and sperm whales, depredating on long lines um, across all the regulatory areas. We had some concerns based on anecdotal reports from the fleet that those were perhaps being underreported for a variety of reasons. Whales are a sensitive topic everywhere. Um, and your recommendation was to follow up with the pretty extensive observer data from the state of Alaska and to provide some comparisons and see how these things um, did or didn't compare to the logbooks. And then also to consider um, moving forward with playing this through the stock assessment. So how big, of, what's the delta on this whole thing? Uh, how big of an effect would it have on management quantity? So I've done both of those things. And I'll start with the comparison with observer data. So by way of background, the observer's primary tasks are monitoring the fisheries and the catch and discards in those fisheries. They of course record uh, depredation when they observe it and they record all marine mammal sightings. But it's, I think it's important to note that marine mammal monitoring is not the observer's primary task. You can imagine on a long liner with a shelter deck, things are covered at night and the observer's focused on the, the catch coming up to the roller there could be lots of things going on outside the lighting of the vessel that the, the observers got no idea about. Um, so for that reason, um, I think it's just important to remember that these are not a, a comprehensive census of marine mammal uh, interactions or even presence around these vessels when they're fishing. 
Some other things to remember are that um, we have logbook data starting in 2017. We have observer data going all the way back into the 1990s. However, there have been some major changes in the observer program, and I've highlighted a couple of them here. Uh, I can provide additional references if you want to learn more about the evolution of the Alaska's observer program, which is a you know, massive undertaking on the order of I don't know, four to seven million dollars a year and you know, extensive amount of observers. The important things for my analysis here are that prior to 2013, the directed halibut fishery was not covered specifically by the observer program. So there were vessels that were catching and retaining halibut that carried observers, but this would have been because they were fishing for other things and also had halibut. And so for that reason, prior to 2013, it's not clear that these data are necessarily representative of the Pacific halibut fishery as we would know it after that fact. Um, in particular, there was very little coverage on vessels less than 60 feet in length. There is still no coverage on vessels less than 40 feet in length, which although they only comprise somewhere around 18 or 20 percent of the catch of halibut, they comprise about almost half of the trips that are that, that are going out. So they're, they're small vessels making small deliveries, but lots of them. Um, and so because of this, um, they're, they're more likely to fish in different areas. They're probably going to be encountering whales, particularly sperm whales at different rates, because sperm whales tend to be in deeper water on the shelf slope break. Um, some other important things to remember about the early observer program was that it was a non-random deployment. So in recent years, um, after the major restructuring in 2013, it's been a pretty um, strongly statistically based deployment plan. Prior to 2013, it was much less statistically rigorous. Um, and so because of that, again, it's, it's not clear exactly what the estimates mean. So when I went through the observer data, I was actually able to use a query that was developed by the um, sablefish analysts in Juneau, who have done a similar analysis for, for depredation on, um, for use in the sablefish stock assessment. So they had already filtered and, and done a lot of work on which fields were necessary. So I was able to obtain that, that information with uh, Basha and our data services team's help. And um, this initial cut, I went through and we looked, they, they, they do report depredation specifically, but for this case, I actually used all sightings as well as depredation. So this could be considered sort of a worst case scenario. So if they reported that there was a whale present um, during the, the fishing activity, I, I'm recording that as potentially an interaction with the fishery at that point, even if there was no specific damage to catch or damage to folks reported. And, and as you'll see, um, even as a maximum estimate, um, this is, these estimates are not as large as we might think. So the other thing that the observers reported that I did some exploration to was they self-report what fraction of the fishing time were they actually observing for marine mammals. And they, they do this as a percentage of the total fishing time of a, of, on a set-by-set -set basis. And so um, the base analysis uses 25%. So they, the observer had to report that at least a quarter of the time they were looking for marine mammals. I did a sensitivity to this where I used 50, 75, and even 95% and found that the rates of inter interaction were very insensitive to this. Uh, but I was a little concerned initially that this might be, they might be missing animals just because they weren't spending a lot of time. It turned out not to be the case. So cutting right to the chase, the, um, the blue lines here are the logbook estimates of the proportion of sets with, in this case, orca whale interactions. And the red lines indicate on an annual basis the proportion of sets in each regulatory area um, where a marine mammal was reported to be present and or depredating by an observer. And so, hmm? why is this opposite? Yeah, it's not what we expected. We expected that the self-reporting might actually be lower, but in, it turns out that in almost all cases, the logbooks are actually reporting a higher rate of depredation. And I, I would encourage focus on the last um, five or six years because that's the area where we have, there's really good overlap between the, the, the two. And I think that the red line in those years probably does represent the fishery quite well. Um, it is, the observer data does pick out the right areas. So we know from the fishery reports that 4A and 4CDE are the two areas that incur the most interaction with orca whales in the fishery. And that's present in both of these data sets. Um, I will note that in 4CD and E, although there are some 
spiky high rates reported from the observers, um, those are very sparse sampling those years. There are very few um, vessels in many of those years fishing in the Bering Sea and even fewer um, that, that carried observers during that time period. But nonetheless, it, the, although they're capturing the right areas, the, the trend is, is not what we expected. It's uh, that the logbooks are actually reporting more whale depredation. 4A is the area with the highest amount of whale depredation in the logs. And as you can see, it's, it's higher than all but 4C, D, and E in the observer data, but not nearly as high as in the logbook information. And I've left 2A and 2B on here just to give you a sense of scale. Um, we, we are still waiting to hear back from Fisheries and Oceans Canada on um, the status of their reporting program. They have a parallel and separate reporting program for marine mammals, which uh, anecdotally we hear may not be getting utilized very much at all. Um, and in 2A, um, there is a potential to look at observer data in 2A, but we've not requested or gone down that path yet. It, generally, marine mammals are a pretty small um, issue in 2A. So that's orca whales, which are generally focused in shallower water. And as I mentioned, 4A and 4CD and E are the areas where those are mostly those interactions are mostly concentrated. For sperm whales, um, you see a different spatial pattern where 2C and 3A are the areas with the highest rate of interactions. And that's that's played out in both of these data sets. Uh, but again, the logbook data is reporting pretty substantially higher rates than the observer information um, in, for both of these areas for all of that time period of overlap. So based on this initial look, and, and again, to be clear, I couldn't really squeeze out any more interactions from the observer data. And anytime they recorded a whale present, it's, it's counted in these plots. So I, I, I don't see any way that, that any of this is related to the way I was filtering the data. Um, I did still want to go through the exercise of investigating, well, what, what might this mean for the stock assessment? You recall from June, I documented this in the June document, that we have um, estimates from the space-time model from our survey fishing activity for when whales are present, what fraction of the catch is likely depredated on. And we're getting that through this um, geostatistical analysis of adjacent stations and stations over time with, without whales. Um, and so from that, we have an estimate for both sperm whales and orca whales. Those estimates are approximately 85% um, of the catch is retained when sperm whales are present compared to what you'd catch if they weren't there, and approximately 50%. So when killer whales are there, they can really tear it up. When sperm whales are there, they seem to take roughly 15% of the catch. With those consumption rates and the encounter rates from the fishery, I can then back out what the likely amount of mortality would be from the fishery. Yep. Well, your, your survey sets are much shorter than commercial sets. They can be shorter. They're not always shorter, um, but yes, they, they definitely can be shorter. It is a leap to, to assign those rates to the fishery. At this point, we don't have a, a, any other way to estimate what's being lost in the fishery. Um, it's certainly possible that with longer sets, a greater fraction of the catch might be lost. We could, uh, that would require a whole nother just statistical analysis, I think, to, to go back. And, you know, based on what we're seeing here, I'm a little skeptical that the observers are really capturing what's going on in Ramble interactions. Yeah, are you going to talk about why you think this bias occurs as offset between observers and observers? Uh, I, I, my best understanding is that this is probably just related to the fact that observer, this is not the observer's primary data. So you think the that when it's really obvious and when it's really there, the observers are certainly recording it. Um, but, but a lot of times the observers are focused on what's coming over the, the rail and they're, they're maybe missing what's going on. So the logbooks is not the full estimate there. I think the logbooks are also an underestimate from what people have self-reported to me that there are some fraction of the fleet is comfortable reporting their interactions and some flat fraction of the fleet is very uncomfortable reporting their marine mammal interactions for a variety of reasons and so i think if anything the logs are probably an underestimate of the true encounter rate and when i've discussed this with several harvesters offline that's their opinion as well generally 
but of course it's a, you know, quantifying that for further analysis it's too impossible right it's this quantifying what you didn't see is a challenging thing especially when people don't want to talk about it necessarily so what i did to just now this is sort of a, a a comic book analysis from here just to better understand how this would play through the process but what i did was i took the average depredation rate from 2017 to 2020 um, from the log books and i applied that all the way back so remember here i would have taken sorry i don't have the, the cursor i would have taken the first three blue points and assumed that that rate applied for the whole time series and I think that's probably an overestimate because we do see some trending here, um, but it seemed to provide something that was larger than I would get from the observer data. And you know, I, I wanted to see what the, what the effect was going through the, the full stock assessment. So I assumed that rate would apply all the way back to um, the early 1990s. And then I did account for the fact that um, sublegal halibut are discarded. So I didn't just apply this to the mortality of sublegal halibut. We assume a 16% discard mortality. I applied it to the full catch and then added that on. Um, so this would be, this, this implicitly assumes that the whales are not size selected. They are eating everything that's coming up on the line, whether the, the harvester would have retained it or not. They're, they're selecting halibut in in proportion to whatever they're being caught at in the fishery so to put this into the stock assessment i then i calculated this this rate um added that to the commercial landings and to the discard mortality for sublegal halibut and then updated all of the the mortality series in the stock assessment and then re-estimated all the model parameters so as if we had had more mortality than we thought um, previously then in order to translate this into a management um, metric, I calculated the yield consistent with the spawning potential ratio that was projected for the adopted catch limits in 2023. So I said, look, this is the level of fishing intensity that the commission selected. What, what catch level would have given the same level of fishing intensity, including whales? And then I sub I calculated what would be the three-year running average of depredation. This is the same approach that's used in the sable fish assessment. They just look at the most recent three years and say, you know, X number of pounds are being, are, are being consumed by whales. And so subtract that off the quota for the upcoming year and see what you're left with and compare that to what you started. And that allows you to see if we had accounted for whales fully explicitly, both in the mortality and in the setting of catch limits, where would we be? And so the net effect of this was about a million and a half pounds of lost yield since 1995, if you summed up all of the estimated whale depredation. So not, not a trivial amount of fish, but pretty small relative to um, yields that have ranged up to 100 million pounds in the late 1990s. Not surprisingly, the assessment model estimates of spawning biomass scale upward. So to have the same trend with more mortality, you have to make the population slightly bigger. So that's that's the the expected result, and it varied a little bit among the four models. The range was 1% to 3% increase in, in spawning biomass over the last few years um, in, across the four stock assessment models. The projection, the three-year average, so 2021, 2021 20, sorry, 2020, 21, 22, the average depredation mortality based on the spatial allocation of the fishery would have put this at about 200,000 pounds of mortality for 2023. So when I recalculate the fishery limits at that XPR, subtract off 200,000 pounds, and we end up effectively right back where we started. So the stock was a little bigger, the quota is a little bigger, but then we subtract a little bit off the quota to look how many whales are gonna eat, basically end up right back where we started within 20,000 pounds of the, the same yield. So to the degree we can, I think this, the conclusion here is that our perception of stock trend and status is not heavily influenced by the reported level of whale depredation. If there is a lot of unreported whale depredation, then obviously this isn't legitimate. And or if we see a very strong trend in the future, this could change. And we could we could get a different perception of, of how things are changing if this starts to trend heavily. I was actually kind of interested if I go back here. 
there is actually quite a bit of trend at, at the end in, in, I would ignore 2C because there's no very little data for 2023, but in 3A, there's a pretty strong trend going on there. And I think that might actually be partly why um, there, there's a slight net positive effect of adding whales because we've got 20 years of whale depredation and then it's actually decreasing a little at the end. So we're actually getting a little yield back at the end of that time series. So that's kind of where we end up on this one. I'm not proposing to start adding whale depredation to every year's tactical analysis based on this. It seems like a small enough effect at this point. Um, but I think perhaps the, the right thing to do here would be to continue on the path that we're going. We've taken a two-pronged approach to whale depredation. Um, one is to try to continue to work with the fleet and encourage them to report their interactions, especially illustrating to people that it doesn't just mean you're going to get a smaller quota. In fact, you might actually end up with a bigger quota, um, depending on the, the trending in the interactions. And then two, as you see in our research perspectives, we're actually, the, the biggest, the best solution for this is to reduce whale depredation in general. And so we're actively pursuing, um, we have a research project that we had this year and, and next year, looking at ways to protect the catch and actually just reduce whale depredation in general. So those are the two prongs that we're taking to evaluate this. And I would suggest that perhaps based on those two, uh, this is something that we may want to revisit in a few years, say, and see whether there's been an appreciable trend and or whether our, our overall perception is any different to, uh, on the net effects of whale depredation. I'll pause there and see if there are any questions or thoughts or. My, my thought is if you had had this analysis before, would you still be doing bike at, uh, whale depredation reduction experiments? I think so, because this is, it may not be a, an aggre a large aggregate effect on the entire fishery, but for some people's business plans, this is a huge factor. There are some areas in the Aleutian Islands and particularly on the Bering Sea uh, shelf slope break where local harvesters just can't fish anymore. And so one of the places that we, one of the responses we've seen in the fishery in, in the Bering Sea, we don't have a map up in here, in the Bering Sea, historically we've had a lot of fishing on the shelf slope break in the Bering Sea, a big, big, big edge. Um, over the last seven or eight years, almost all of that fishing has shifted to St. Matthew Island in the north part of the Bering Sea in shallow water from deep water along that edge. And that's largely in response to just constant whale presence on the edge. People just you set gear and you lose everything to whale, so you move on. So the part of what's going on here is the fishery is responding and reducing these counter rates on their own. And they're doing that in ways like shifting all of their yield to places where the whales, for whatever reason, don't seem to want to go. Um, in the long term, I do think it's still important for the commission to be evaluating ways to assist the fishery in, in, in accessing the broader spatial uh, distribution of the, of the fishery. The other, the other reason to be pursuing research on whale depredation is to support our, the long term um, our long-term fishery independent survey activity. So we currently, we're not at a level of whale depredation that's prohibited for our survey activity. We lose a modest number of stations on, on the range of maybe three to 5% a year. Uh, but in certain areas, we lose a higher fraction and we could end up in a place where we need some additional tools to do survey activity in these areas. And so things like the catch protection device, which you'll hear about later, uh, could potentially be turned into a survey tool at some as well to allow us to get an estimate of abundance in areas where the whales are too too prevalent to actually fish on protected water. Is there any value in working with the observer program to make observations part of their process so you have a reliable baseline? They are. They are definitely part of their, I mean, they, they have to fill out a form every time they see whale. I, I think that this is more just a, a, a feasibility thing is that a single observer on a, on a vessel potentially fishing 24 hours a day, uh, fully tasked, is just not going to record all of the whale interactions that are going on. I, I, I think they are, it is a reliable estimate of what the observer sees from what I understand from the observer program. 
there's they're certainly reporting fully. I think it's just not possible for them to cover all the right. But I guess I was wondering if that could be part of their job to actually look for whales because it sounds like that's the issue right there. If they're recording them, if they see them reliably recording them, but they're not looking. To, to do there. It, it's just this issue of the log books. We don't even know whether that's an underestimate or yeah. an overestimate. Yeah. It's having like some known baseline to compare it to. It's full. And it seemed like the observer data was going to be that, but then it came in so low that it's obviously yeah. not. Right? I, I, I don't know enough about the observer program to know whether tasking them with something additional like this is feasible. But having, Having some known baseline where it's always detected if that happens would be useful. And I'm sure there's some sensitivity there about asking them to do something that's not officially part of their jobs. Yeah, I, I, I suspect that we fairly unable to task the North Pacific Observer Program with anything. I also think they are pretty fully tasked. Um, and also that the observer coverage rates for the directed Pacific halibut fishery, as I mentioned, the rates are generally 15 to 20% of trips are covered. And that's only on the larger vessels. So the under 40 foot vessels, there's zero coverage right now. And there's some development of electronic monitoring going on in the, in the fixed gear in the long line fleet. But I suspect that Electronic monitoring is actually going to result in fewer marine mammal observations rather than more because these are cameras focused on the fishing activity. So, honestly, I don't I don't have a strong, solid recommendation there on that. No. What about observations from FIS? We certainly use those, but as Sean mentioned, our, our fishing activity is quite different on the FIS than the average harvester in so the commercial you, fishery. So, so, you think the rates of observing marine mammals? Because of that. Yeah, I, I'm much more comfortable using the rates of consumption when whales have found the set and are actively depredating than I am on the rates of interaction because we set somewhat shorter pieces of gear and we space our sets 10 nautical miles apart. The fishery will often go to an area and set multiple sets in, in close proximity. And if the whales get on them, they're on every set. And so, and, and similarly, our, for our fists, we tell our skippers to take evasive action when they need to. So if they start hauling and whales show up, they'll buoy that gear off and leave and come back later and try and avoid having a whale interaction where the, the fleet often doesn't have that luxury. If they've got all their gear set in one place, they don't have any choice but to haul it. It will wait a little while. Yeah. Okay. So that's a summary of where we've gotten to on uh, whale depredation. As I mentioned, there is potentially a little bit more data available from 2A and 2B, um, but I suspect, particularly for 2B, it's going to be even less comprehensive than, than what we've seen here for Alaska. Are the assessment models very compensatory? Um, in terms of Recruitment dynamics, mm, but also I was thinking the spawning stop files kind of went up. Yeah, so I think that's because we're fitting closely to the trend in the survey, mm. and if we're fitting the same trend, the survey has the actual whatever the unknown but true whale depredation is is already baked into the data sets that we have. So to fit that same survey index with more or less by. Uh, uh, mortality occurring to the stock, that's going to generally scale the, the biomass of the stock up and down. So I think that was fair, a fairly expected result that the we're getting a similar, we're, we're getting the, I, I'm, I see this as getting the response that we expect. When you add more mortality, you generally, your, your biomass estimate goes up slightly. It's a constant mortality. Right. So if you start getting trends, right. then, then all bets are off. Exactly. And that's where I think we might we might just put this on the list of things to check in on periodically to see if there are continued trends. The concern with whale depredation is that this is going to get worse over time, not better. That these whales live a long time, sperm whales even longer than orca whales, but even orca whales 60, 80 years, and they teach each other how to do this. And all the evidence is that this is a growing problem that began in approximately 1995 because that's when the quota programs went in. 
So prior to that, this was a derby fishery that occurred over one to three days in the last few years before the derby. And then once the derby, once the derby was over and quota fishing went in, the fishery was spread out over seven to nine months of the year. And the whales had lots of time to figure out how to interact with this food. And that this problem is probably continuing to get worse. The other factor that's occurring is that the sablefish fishery in the last five years has almost completely transitioned to pot fishing in Alaska, leaving the halibut target as the only ones with bare hooks in the water. And so there's a lot of concern that the whales will be shifting their focus of attention from sablefish fishing to halibut fishing, even though there does seem to be some preference for sablefish as a to consume, can't blame them there. The, the whales choose the higher caloric uh, bonus, um, but the, nonetheless, there's there's still depredation going on. Okay, um, moving then into the second, the the recommendation was to retain equal weighting across the four models. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think I showed this plot in uh, June, but this is the predictive, um, the the model prediction, the, the model fit to our survey time series, survey index in terms of numbers of fish um, and the prediction for 2023. And, and I wanted to highlight this because uh, preliminarily, it looks like the survey is gonna be down in 2023, but all of these models were projecting flat to slightly increasing trend in the survey. Um, so this is going to be, as we've we've seen, looking at the, the May statistic and the predictive skill over the last few years, sometimes little differences like this actually have a pretty big effect on the relative performance of each of the models. So I just found it interesting that we have had, um, we continue to have ups and downs in terms of which models are doing a better or worse job on an annual basis predicting the upcoming, the, the yet, as of yet unobserved survey index. So I think moving forward, we'll I'll continue to calculate May statistics um, and continue to investigate some other avenues that, that I want to look at for uh, model weighting. But of course, for this year, we will retain equal weighting. And it would probably be helpful if the SRB would reiterate that recommendation from June, just so that it's, it's easier for people to find and uh, us to point to as we move into this year's uh, assessment process. Um, okay, so I did want to highlight we in June, I also presented some summary of the effect of the sex specific information from the commercial fishery. So recall that we do a genetic assay on fin clips from fish that are landed in ports which have been dressed at sea so we can no longer tell males from females. That information lags a year. And um, so we process those samples back here in the office. And since the June meeting, we now have the 2022 um, sex ratios at age. So these, these show you the age compositions and actually the fits from one of the four models um, for the time period over which we have uh, this information. I included 2016 in here just so you can see um, the transition from sex is aggregated to sex specific information. Of course, the blue lines on the bottom of each um, polygon shape are the males um, very few males in the commercial fishery. It's roughly 80 to 85% female. Um, and what I, I wanted to highlight a couple of things here. Um, one is, and I'll get to on the next slide, is that um, there was an effect of replacing the aggregate males and females in 2022 with the sex specific information without any other changes to the stock assessment models. We'll talk about that in a second. And the second one was just an interesting thing that's that's cropped up. It wasn't entirely visible in the data until we got the sex specific information. But here I'm going to highlight age 15. And if you look at starting at 2016, we had a strong 2005 year class. And that year class was, of course, 11 years old in 2016 and then 12, 13, 14. And it hit 15 in 2020. And then it's been 15. It's been 15 years old for the last two years. And it wasn't in the aggregated data, the males actually seem to be tracking, but the females, especially in 2022, the males got older and the females stayed 15 years old. Um, so I think this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, this is pretty rare in the halibut data that the age compositions usually track very closely, one year older every year. 
Uh, so I actually wonder if maybe the environmental conditions have made the checks difficult to, to read, or so there's something about um, the conditions in the last couple of years that have, that have created this. The second is, I think, getting back to our earlier discussion, this is, of course, challenging when we think about using this as a training data set for something like AI, because I, I'm pretty confident that in 2021 and 2022, that little peak shouldn't be at age 15. It should actually be at age 16 and 17. Um, most of the fish are in that younger year class. You'll see in 2019, you start to see the first hint of the 2012s. And then in 2021, you see the 2012s um, at age nine. And then in 2022, they're 10. So the, the 2012s are tracking quite nicely. Uh, but the, 20, the 2005s have, seem to have stalled a bit at age 15. So this is, of course, going to be challenging when we think about using this training data set for AI because there's already some error built into this data set. Um, at this point, I don't think it's causing a major lack of fit in the stock assessment, but it's certainly something to, to think about as we as we think generally about our, our aging. As Basha mentioned, um, in the stock assessment, I have two different um, aging methods. I have surface aging and uh, our current break and bake aging, the surface aging becomes biased after about age 15. And after age 15, the average red age tends to lag behind what we would estimate the true age to be. They, so they undercount rings when they're just aging the surface of the oval. The, the break and bake method doesn't show that same bias. And we validated that with um, the bomb radiocarbon analysis based on fish during nuclear testing track the rise in that signal and the age of fish from cohorts before, during, and after that signal. And, and we find that our break and bake method is generally quite unbiased um, and reasonably precise. But nonetheless, occasionally we do get little quirks like this in, in the aging. We've got a couple of runs there. 2019, 2020, those are fairly large residual errors there. They don't look like much on because of the scale of the plot up there. Really large. Yeah, they're not. Um, do, I wouldn't focus too much on the the fit here because this is this this model is tuned. So these residuals are tuned to be uh, approximately standard normal based on reweighting. So they may they may look a little bit big here, but they are not extreme in terms of Pearson residuals. There's also a run of them. Yeah, well, it's, 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 yes, yep. this particular model is not fitting that, that peak. Now, I, I think for 2021 and 2022, it's not surprising that it's not fitting that peak because they shouldn't be there. <laughs> so that's probably also compromising 2020 a bit as well, this model run. Like I said, though, it's interesting to see that the males generally are tracking. You can, there's much less pronounced peak, but they are actually following the age progression a lot better. It's interesting. Again, this wasn't very obvious until we parsed out the males and females. It was it was a little bit suspect in the aggregate data, but much more pronounced when we look at these two things separately. So the piece of really targets or intentionally, but unintentionally females. Yeah, I would say intentionally. The females, because of dimorphic growth, the females are much larger. Mm -hmm. So they really are. And, and with with the addition of a minimum size limit, many of the males don't even reach the minimum size limit. Yeah. And so the males are, are discarded. I was wondering how the fishing changes the sex ratio. It, it certainly does. We, we, as I said, we estimate the sex ratio in the commercial catch to be approximately 80 to 85% female. And so that means that it has a much larger effect on, in terms of fishing intensity on the reproductive output of the stock than it would say if it were 50-50. And this was when in the 2019 stock assessment, when we first had access to this information. Until 2019, we'd gone 100 years without knowing the sex ratio of the commercial catch. And this actually had a pretty big effect on our understanding of the, the effect of fishing on the stock. And in fact, it caused us to revise upward our estimate of uh, fishing intensity fairly substantially during, for the, during the 2019 stock assessment. So these data, even though we only have a few years of, of information here, um, are increasingly important to tell us you know, that the fishery is targeting and continues to target uh, females. 
and maybe just to emphasize that so every year i have i'm i'm lagged one year so in the 2020 Two stock assessment, the 2022 fishery data was sexes aggregated because we hadn't done the genetic assay yet. So I had all the ages, but I didn't have males and females separated. So what I did to investigate the effect of this was I added, um, I took the sexes aggregated data out and I put the sex specific age comps in. And the result across all the four models was a two and a half percent reduction in the spawning biomass at the end of the time series. For one year of aggregated data. Yep. Yep. And so to, to me, you know, two and a half percent obviously still in the error bars of the assessment output, but particularly in a case where we have a relatively low stock and it's declining, I think this is a pretty important piece of information. And, and given that, we had some discussion in June about whether we might consider skipping a year or two years of this information. And I would suggest that now might not be the right time to do that, given that the results are still moderately sensitive to this improved information. I think it may be important to continue to um, do this genetic assay, at least for another year or two. We are in between major year classes. So we have the 2005 year class, which is fading rapidly in the, in the um, fishery yield. And the 2012 year class coming along behind, as we shift toward these younger year classes, we would expect potentially a shift in the sex ratio because the, as it, it's a little bit more obvious here, you can see the sex ratio of younger ages. If you just look at the area under the curve in red and blue, left and right of age 15, younger fish, it's even a much higher fraction female than older fish. So this information is pretty critical to understanding how the fishery is interacting with these younger year classes. Um, and so our recommendation right now, even though we, we talked about maybe not um, continuing with an annual genetic assay schedule, I think right now might not be the right time to make that transition. It might be better to do another year or two years. And then depending on stock trend and dynamics, consider reducing our frequency of, of running the, the genetic assay at that point. Yeah, I, understood the, Sorry. Yeah. I understand that, and, but the part I'm not quite getting is the, given the likelihood of the reduced FIS in 2024, therefore do uh, the genetics. Yeah, so, I, sorry, we we used to present the FIS stuff first and then the assessment second. The, um, we, because of the reduced catch rates and increased costs, as you'll see from uh, Dr. Webster's presentation, we may end up with a very small footprint for the survey. And because of that, the stock assessment will be relying even more heavily on fishery samples. And so I think having the additional resolution in the fishery samples, which are going to, the fishery samples are going to be comprehensive across all the areas where the survey may be limited to a pretty small <laughs> financially viable core. That's just another reason why this might not be a great year to reduce our effort. Yeah, I was just wondering what kind of selection do you first show? It's kind of fishing bosses on the towards uh, early maturing small females. Yeah. We, that's been a topic of, of uh, that's probably the primary focus of our research program right now is understanding um, reproductive output. We're, unfortunately, we're, we're still quite a ways from understanding trends in that. Um, we, there's also the potential for this just to affect growth even before reproduction. The challenge there is that we, we have, and an, sorry, Sometimes we do a, a historical recap for new SRB members. These guys have heard a lot of this stuff before. Uh, we do have a long time series of biological information going back all the way to the 1930s. And um, what, what the, the, biggest, the biggest pattern we've seen over that time period is large changes in size at age, but not just in one direction. So we actually had size at age was low in the 1930s and 40s, and it actually increased over a period of heavy exploitation up until the late 1970s. And then we've had decreasing size at age since then. So that doesn't immediately suggest fishing as a as the primary driver of reduced size at age, but it certainly could be a contributor, particularly in the more modern period. Yeah. 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 Yeah
but I, I think you're right. This is uh, monitoring reproductive uh, output of the stock is currently our highest priority. But we are at, only now at the point of setting, trying to set a baseline. We're really not at the point of being able to monitor change over time. Just continue on Anna's comment on the sex ratio. I mean, you know, we commented on the sex ratio based on the commercial information, but we also have obviously the sex ratios from the from the FIS over a much longer uh, time series. And uh, surprisingly, I mean, and that would probably be a better indicator of natural sex ratios. But the sex ratio in the FIS is seventy percent female, thirty percent male, and that's including uh, what we call under sized or under age fish so you know the, the fish catches usually fish starting at age three four four to five four, four or five because so a little use, younger than because we use large hooks the fish gear itself has a selectivity for size as well so even the fish is entirely independent of selecting females over males so our fisheries independent cell life survey also shows that skewed sex ratio towards females but it's it's regional too it's not the same ratio it is across. yeah the sex ratio is very considerably across space in the stock as well okay um so remaining development for 2023 as i mentioned we don't have any major changes proposed for the models or the data given that this is an updated update year and that None of the analysis we've done for June or for now, to me at least, suggests a, a change we need to make this year um, to the basic approach of, of, of these four stock assessment models. This just provides you with the, the laundry list of things that get updated on an annual basis. Uh, you'll hear more about potential FIS designs for 2024. The 2023 FIS is concluded, but we don't yet have the analysis completed. The data, we just had it the, the last of the QA, QC meetings last week, so the data are still in processing. So it'll be still some time before we have the final results from this year's survey. Um, and then, of course, we update not only the 2023 information for any of these sources, but also any previous data that was, a, that was preliminary or incomplete at the time of the analysis. So for example, the commercial fishery was still operating when we closed the data since last year. So this year, the 2022 commercial data will include all data through the end of the fishery. So we, re we reprocess the entire time series every time anything new gets included. Um, and then there are a couple of sources like patrol surveys and um, the, the biological information from the recreational fisheries uh, from, the, from the Gulf of Alaska that lag one year. They get collected one year, sent back to us, we age them, and then they get included a year later. So there will be some new data for 2022 as well um, that weren't available for last year's stock assessment. No, no changes on this from previous years. This is all standard. And so the, the recommendations here are um, just to note this paper, um, recommend any changes that you find would be helpful for specifically for this year's final stock assessment and then perhaps have some additional conversation and, and or requests for things you might want to see next year extensions of this or other topics or anything that you see fit those, those recommendations under b are going to be small you've got open now over you say too Yes, generally we would reserve that for things that you have asked for, seen, and liked or disliked and have a specific recommendation. So I think in this case, it would be helpful to recommend yes or no, include whale depredation in this year's assessment. And yet, and assuming you still have the recommend or the request from June, sorry, recommendation from June, recommend that I continue. And recommend continued annual sampling of size I think so, at least for the next year or two, given the stock status trend and challenges with like this. In terms of the whale depredation, obviously it's a small impact, but do you have strong feelings about which way, which way it should go? Are you inclined to include it or? 
Yeah, it's a it's a tough question. It, it adds a level of complexity to the calculations. Now I have to explain to people that we add it on and subtract it off. And, but on the other hand, it is mortality that we understand to be there. I guess my reservation is that it is, I still think that this may be an underrepresentation of the scope of the problem. Um, but I don't have a strong recommendation of how to fix that at this point. I've done sensitivity to larger values periodically in the assessment, just showing that if the if the unobserved mortality were say 10% of the total and it was trending, it can have an effect on the our, our comparison to reference points. I've done those sensitivities in previous assessments, but if it's totally hypothetical, it's tough. But yeah, exactly. So 20,000. It, the net and that's and that's kind of where they've ended up with sablefish as well they, they added this to the stock assessment uh, must have been seven or eight years ago it comes out to be a fairly small component with offsetting values of you know raising the stock and then subtracting back off the quota and they actually recommended last year to then to take it back out of the analysis just to simplify things because it was a large largely a net zero effect um, I, they haven't done that yet um, so I, I don't know. I guess my recommendation at this point is probably to not explicitly add it, but maybe to speak to it a little bit and see how the, the issue unfolds in the next few years. Certainly, it's not it's not that hard to include it, but it does add another layer of complexity to the various analysis. I think that was my inclination as well. That this is still too much in the research phase and scoping the potential scale of the problem. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of unsupported assumptions that need to be made in order to do that. But if we had a very reliable index all the way from 95 forward, I wouldn't hesitate to just put it in. It's a source of mortality. It just goes in with everything else. But because of all of these kind of I'm using the maximum estimate, but I'm assuming it's underreported and I'm you know, taking the average and applying that back to 95, it just, it's a lot of hand waving. I'm somewhat reassured that it's not a huge effect at this point. But, um, that seems like good appendix material and an yeah. assessment yeah. saying this is what we can include. Still don't have the numbers we need to be able to include it really quantitatively. And yeah. also we feel like excluding it is okay because the kind of size is pretty easy. That's right. And I think the challenging part of the message there is just recognizing that this is really important to some individual harvesters. So I don't want to discount the fact that this is a very important issue for particular people it's not maybe an aggregate it's a net it's a small net effect uh, but it is very important for certain components of the fishery so i don't want to i don't want to underplay that either so forward to say the, the full assessment coming up at 25. are there issues that you anticipate dealing with that maybe we should get a jump on yeah, so we have prioritized um, in the five-year research plan the pieces that, that we think would have the biggest effect on the stock assessment. And we picked off quite a few of those in the 2022 full assessment. So estimation of natural mortality, uh, bootstrapping of the data to provide a starting point for data weighting, uh, a number of these things we, we already hit in the 2022 stock assessment. I, I think, as you'll hear from Joseph, we're, we're proceeding very well on our assessment of reproductive potential in stock. And that one has potentially a large effect when we are able to include that information in the stock assessment, because that's gonna potentially affect both sides, the numerator and the denominator of our, our status calculations. It's gonna affect the reference points as well as the current uh, stock estimates. So I think that maybe will be lined up in terms of timing for that information to getting fully evaluated and included in 25 stock assessment. The wild card there is that we may have a much reduced fist design next year, which would be a year that we have been counting on to, to collect additional fecundity samples in particularly region four. So we may or may not have access to those samples. So that would that would definitely be one. Um, I presented, actually, I didn't provide it for you all, but for the commissioners at our work meeting, I provided a brief synopsis of um, the components in the five-year research plan and 
how much of an effect I thought they might have on the stock assessment. And I could recap that for you briefly if you wanted. It would take a minute to call up the presentation. But the, the number one was reproductive output, maturity schedules, fecundity, and or skip spawning. You know, those things feeding into stock reproductive output. Yeah, that might be worth looking at. Uh, what about this issue on the age composition of females? Into more or I suspect that one will be gone next time we see it. Like I said, this is pretty rare that our age comps generally the cohorts track very consistently. So it's gonna be gone. Well, I would be surprised if we didn't see the two thousand fives either decreased in abundance so much that you don't see them anymore or back on where we expect them to be in the age comps. This, this issue is the 2005 or it's the 2005. So the 12s are tracked just fine. So, and, and because those are going to be the most important moving forward, I it's, honestly, I'm not, I, I flagged it because I think it's interesting, but I don't really see it as a major issue for the assessment. Yeah, so if you have that. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. I did, we didn't warn the staff. If we could have access to my PowerPoint from the, they probably haven't loaded it. We might need to get them to load it and, and get to that after lunch. If they need to put it into Adobe. We might need to just re okay. revisit this. Yeah, sorry, we didn't we didn't warn them that, that we might want to access that presentation. They need to load it into the program. I believe. But it's just a couple of slides going through the research recommendations and a, a very candid assessment of which ones we've done and which ones I think might have a big effect on the assessment. So that's it for me. Okay, so we have around 15 minutes roughly until lunchtime. But Edwin's is probably, I'll probably fit in there. Yeah, we can make really good progress on that. I'll finish. <coughs> Just go to that. All right, so we can bring up the presentation for the missile book, which is paper 07. If I could make a, be made a presenter, that would be great. I could control it from my computer. Do you want to just resend that? Yeah, I'll send them. Should sure. I send it to you or? Yeah, I'm actually sure who's on support. Whoever's on support's working quick. Good. Yeah. Uh, should I begin then? No, let's just okay. wait. We wanted some old. You need slightly longer. At one of those old timey photo places. <laughs> <laughs> on the front of that book. Some dinner tomorrow night. 
Yes. It's going to be a, a challenge because a lot of us are doing many things, but uh, okay. we'll figure a way. Have they, did um, someone reach out to you already with a venue? No. They did? Okay. Here's another second. There is somewhere staying, so they couldn't get you in over here. So it's somebody over here. It's really good. You be walking distance from the other side. Don't worry. Okay, take it away, Ellen. All right. Well, good morning. And um, I'm going to give you some updates on the, the MSE section of the, um, of the work that I've been doing. Uh, and there were a number of requests and recommendations, so we'll be walking through all of those. Uh, the way that I've organized this uh, presentation for you is sort of the different concepts that were in the requests and recommendations, starting from the operating model to um, a little bit of look at objectives and performance metrics. Uh, there was a request talking about equalizing MP performance based on an objective. We did a little bit of work on that. Um, examining the FIS data scenarios, which is uh, exciting work that the Commission's also very interested in. Um, and then looking at exceptional circumstances and then um, some ideas for management procedures to continue uh, evaluating or putting into the program of work. So with the uh, what we're calling the 2023 operating model, as, as Ian noted, um, the stock assessment and the MSE are on a sort of similar schedule now. And I, we think it works really well. There's an updated assessment presented. Um, the 2022 uh, assessment was presented. And then immediately after that, the MSE operating model was um, updated to reflect all those larger changes in that assessment. So you can say that this operating model is now consistent with all the ideas coming from the 2022 stock assessment, including the change in um, natural mortality for one of the four models. So the, the operating model is also based on four um, individual models. It's an ensemble of those four individual models. Um, and these are area specific models to remind you um, with multiple fisheries. I think there's 33 different leads in there for different regulatory areas and sectors. Um, one SRB recommendation from SRB 22 was to um, use priors during the conditioning process to make it a more reproducible um, product. And so we've tried to incorporate that as best we could. We'd already started the conditioning process at the last SRB, but we've documented in the 2023 technical document a lot of the details and how we went through the conditioning process, as well as um, the outcomes, um, a lot more detailed outcome in that document. And I do apologize, I didn't get that finished until a week ago, last Monday it was posted. So I don't expect you to have thoroughly reviewed it, but we can walk through any questions that you may have. So this is uh, in purple, the condition, conditioned operating model. Um, with the lighter areas are uh, in the beginning is the historical period, and that's what's conditioned to. Um, and then the darker purple and the individual lines is a projection under a SPR 43% policy, um, which is our reference uh, level. Just to show what the projections do look like in terms of spawning biomass on the top, relative spawning biomass on the bottom, and then what we've also done is put in these gray areas, which show the short term period, the medium term period, um, which are used for calculating performance metrics. Um, and then the long term period is just the end of this time series. And so one thing that's interesting to note is these individual trajectories vary widely um, over a 60 year projection period. They can go up and down quite a bit. Um, and a lot of that is due to the environmental um, relationship with R0 that's uh, modeled in here, as well as the change in weighted age that's also uh, modeled as part of the projection, a random, the, both of those are random processes with autocorrelation. Let's just ask about that. It struck me as Ian was talking about changes in weighted age. Is there any, as far as I, density dependence? you ever condition putting that in there? 
we, we've thought about that quite a bit and it's you know something that could be easily put in as a process but we just haven't found the the um the, the real support for density dependent growth you know as ian suggested in times of heavy fishing um the weighted age went up and also in times of heavy fishing the weighted age has gone down so we just haven't been able to link a real clear density dependent process to the changes in weighted age um and i Joseph and, and the, the research branch here has been doing a lot of work on trying to understand the, um, the growth process and what is affecting that those changes over time. And I, I don't know, you just haven't found a real simple modeling or, or something to really pin it on that we could put into a model. No, no, we haven't got there yet. Um, we've just, uh, I'll make a brief mention later, we just basically Try to identify tools to measure somatic growth. That's one of the possible reasons behind the, that change in site to page. That's all. So, just a cohort growth curve, growth curve for each cohort, and then looking at. Yeah, it's more simple than growth that. parameters. It's more than more simple than that. How we're modeling it actually. Is just a random process on the deviations and growth. Well, I know how you're doing it. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, as far as looking for density and growth, you look at it by cohort. Yeah, well, um, there has been students at UW that have done research. There's been um, uh, staff here, and you know, 20, 30 years ago that have done research. And um, I remember one student at UW, I think it was a PhD work, tried to look at cohort effects, year effects, and just couldn't pin anything down on it. It was pretty promising in its density dependence until about the time Bill Clark published his paper on density dependence around 20 years ago. And then the stock continued to go down and weighted age continued to go down for the next couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And there was, as Alan mentioned, there have been a couple of bioenergetics analyses. There was a, a hypothesis about arrowtooth flounder potentially being also a component of the density that's regulating density dependent growth. Um, that was, what's her name? Cheryl Barnes. Cheryl Barnes, PhD really on that. Too. And that didn't really pan out. Um, and so it's it's turned out to be a little more complicated. There's some additional work going on at Alaska Pacific University looking at diet and actually finding that fish of the same size but different age actually have slightly different diet characteristics which would suggest that it may actually have a component rather than a density dependent component. But we, we just don't have a simple mechanism to hit it on. Would that be like echoforms feeding on foods? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got, we've got some spatial hotspots where fish are always behind in terms of size and age. And we're trying to understand, is it because they're in that place or is it, or are they in that place because they get behind and don't make the migration that the rest of the fish around them that are growing faster are making? So it's the, the migratory dynamics create a whole nother level of challenge in this. And also a, um, an ontogenetic change in diet preferences, right. younger fish having different prey. Yeah. So yeah, so one, one thing about that, that I've been thinking a lot about the MSC analysis is really this new paradigm of this MSC analysis is relatively new here at IPHC, even though harvest policy analysis has been going on for a long time. And you know, I'd like to put a lot of research into the operating model, but there's also other aspects that the commission needs to work on or would like to work on, like developing a harvest strategy policy getting that document written and <laughs> yeah so so i you know i'm hoping we can make some progress on developing that a management procedure for the commission and then maybe go back and visit some things i have some you know some ideas just floating in my head on how to do migration and integrating tag work and, you know things like that which would be great just got some other tasks to, to focus on as well
So yeah, it's uh, four individual models, as I mentioned, parameterized from um, the 2022 stock assessment models. So some parameters are taken from those models and a lot of ideas are taken from the stock assessment and that tactical model and put into the strategic model. Um, there's age specific movement between these four different regions um, and the estimated parameters that there aren't really many I'm calling estimated in the sense of the conditioning. Um, but they're just the uh, unfished uh, virgin equilibrium biomass, um, the proportion of age zero recruits going to each region. So it's operating on a single coast-wide spawning biomass. And then um, movement from region four to three and then from region three to two. Those are the only movement that is actually estimated. Other movements parameterized based on previous analyses using tag data, um, which is, this is the main sort of movement of the stock. So those other movements are just a fixed rate? Yep, fixed rates constant at age. No, um, yeah, constant over time. Um, but the movement that's estimated here, four to three and three to two, is basically different for low PDO regimes and high PDO regimes. So there's only two stances, you might think, but they flip flop back and forth. There's one other parameter estimated that I forgot about, and that's um, initial, uh, a sort of initial fishing mortality that determines the amount of fishing that occurred at the start of the model when it's um, uh, when it's creating the numbers at age for 1957. So we're starting these in 1957. And so a parameter, I put in an initial amount of uh, fishing mortality, and then there's a parameter that just scales it up and down slightly to best fit the starting point of the model. But it's just, you know, sort of a to get it at a starting point for them and then the data becomes informative. Is it an equilibrium in 1957 with respect to that? Um, yes, it assumes it's at uh, the age structures. At, well, no, no, no. It, it's taking um, estimated well, recruitment deviations from the stock assessment, also applying those. But it has to adjust sort of the, the scale of the population up and down to, to give it a good start, basically. Yeah. How much fishing is assumed? Where, where does that estimate end up? Is it assumed to be F that's it, already applied? It, I mean, it's a significant, it, it's not a huge F uh, in, in its regional specific. There was not a lot of fishing in region four before the 1950s. So that's pretty small. Um, and this multiplier, it's a single multiplier that operates on each region, but I input a value for each region based on average catch over the Say the previous 20 years or so it was. Um, so it's different by region. The F is different by region, but this multiplier just sort of scales it up and down to get it in the right space. In regions two and three, which are you know the um, south su southern areas, uh, the fishing mortality is quite high. Quite high. I'm not sure what it is in terms of that. There are already substantial fisheries. Yes. Yes. And it's. Um, each of these four models has a little bit different picture how it started there. And you can even see that in the stock assessment, the two long models, one of them, the long coastwide, I think, goes really low historically, whereas the areas of fleets model stays quite, quite a bit higher historically. And so these models sort of parallel that, and some of them depress it, some of them increase it, but the multiplier is not, I mean, it's like 0.8, or 1.2 at the most. It's not adjusting that initial mortality by wild amounts, but I found it just really helped stabilize the model. So that is something I, I forgot to add to the technical side. Um, and then during that conditioning process, sort of what we're conditioning to, what we're trying to match the best to, is um, estimated spawning biomass from the stock assessment. And each of these four individual models is sort of assigned one of those stock assessment models. So it's the reason there's four is that it's conditioning to the estimated spawning biomass from the individual stock assessment. And that gives sort of that similar structural uncertainty that the stock assessment has. Uh, but it's also incorporating um, stock distribution from our fishery independence outline survey. So we're conditioning to that, which is a very important uh, source to condition to, I believe, because a lot of the management procedures, uh, it, uh, 
least a few years ago, wanted to look at distribution procedures and how stock distribution had effect on distribution of TCY. So we felt it was very important to make sure we're getting stock distribution right. Um, and then we have the FIS indices and proportions that age in there as well as part of the conditioning process. So just a couple of things to compare between these four individual models. I've put up on the top the natural mortality for females and males. And so you can see how natural mortality differs between those four models. Um, these are the natural mortality that comes from the stock assessment. I've taken it from the stock assessment and fixed it in these. So I'm not trying to estimate it or anything like that. So you can actually see the range of M that's estimated in the 2022 stock assessment. Um, there's also sigma R differs slightly, but again, as I said, the conditioning spawning biomass, that is the spawning biomass that comes, that the model comes from. So all of the parameters for OM1 are very consistent with the long AAF individual stock assessment model, um, and then is conditioned to that spawning biomass as well. <clears throat> And so what I wanted to show in this picture down here is a, I have this a similar plot that you've seen previously, except this time we're doing projections without fishing. Um, but historically, what you can see is the light blue area, and that's the ensemble stock assessment, the fifth and 95th quantiles there. And there's a median as well in a darker blue line. And that median overlaps the dark blue purple. Um, very closely. And as you can see, the, the operating model, especially in the um, years near 2020, is, has slight, a slight bit more variation than the ensemble does, a slightly wider bit of uncertainty there than the ensemble stock assessment. But it matches uh, quite well. And um, that's sort of the idea of this conditioning is to, is to get that trend right, but make sure we have a decent amount of uncertainty to project from. So the stock is now like historically very low. Yes, it's at um, potentially some of the lowest values yeah. historically. But all the predictions are kind of positive indicating some recovery. Yeah, and this is without fishing. Yeah. yeah. But but even um, so, we did some calculations. Um, I think with uh, SPR forty three percent policy there was still a 30 some percent chance of stock decline in the MSE operating model. The stock assessment last year did that same projection at what, 25% or 38%. It's based on what they adopted. Yeah, so, so we sort of ground truthing the stock assessment in the MSE and the near term projections and, and they, they came out pretty soon. Maybe the MSE was like 20 something and the stock assessment was 38%. So. How sensitive? the predictions are to assumptions made on recruitment dynamics there are a lot of assumptions i think the mse may be slightly more optimistic than the stock assessment in these next three year projections because of the mse allows weighted age to vary um so where the stock assessment are you using an average of recent years i forget what it is yeah i use the most recent three-year average weighted age for the stock assessment but for the stock is for the tactical analysis, we only do three year projections. And because these fish are not um, showing up in the survey of the fishery until five to eight years later, we're not really depending on recruitment for the short term projections. Those fish are, are, have already been observed a few times. Uh, it's only when we look at longer term projections that recruitment becomes critical. And so in the in the operating model, we allow weighted age, it's a random process, we just simulate deviations where weighted age can increase or decrease, but weighted age is also at the lowest values we've observed, or almost the lowest values we've observed in the whole time series. So in that random process of weighted age, we don't actually let it go much lower. I think another 10% lower or something, we wanted some bounds. But since we've never observed smaller fish at age, we just felt like we can't simulate that process as well. So there's more ability for it to simulate larger fish at age in the near, well, the next 10 or 20 years. So 
So a couple more results from the operating model that, that we found are very interesting. We're showing some plots here of the distribution of eight zero recruits. So the process is there's a coastwide spawning biomass. It spawns a bunch of age zero fish wherever they are along the coast. But then we assign those age zero fish to a specific region. That's where they settle and then grow and then migrate from. So it's an important part of the, the process. And what you can see in each of the operating models, there are some, some differences. Um, and a couple of things I want to note is the, the blue dots. Well, first, the, the same color next to each other are low and high PDO here. So there's a difference between those environmental conditions. And what you can see is OM1 in the blue shows a almost basically similar distribution, but the other operating models show increased uh, distribution to region four. Um, in the high PDO, which actually agrees with the paper by Sidoris et al. staff here at IPHC um, that was put out a couple of years ago, that in those warmer years, the distribution tends to distribute more into the Bering Sea. So that's, that, that's helpful um, to see. OM1 is a little different in that region three gets more recruits, but um, where region three gets fewer in the other models. Um, but the overall result is fewer re recruiting to regions two, most to regions three and four, and a few to region four B. A new plot that um, we decided to experiment with is trying to understand movement. And remember, we're estimating the movement from four to three and three to two. These are again the four operating model, individual models in the operating model. And it's showing what we're calling lifetime movement. All that we've done here is we take one minus the product at, at, an, at a, each age of um, it not moving to the other area. So what's one minus it not moving from four to three? Um, but we, we, we take the product of it not moving at age from four to three, and then one minus that gives the probability over its lifetime that it would move from four to three. So you can see there's a high probability of it moving from four to three and smaller probabilities of it moving from three to two. Um, some consistency there, um, but in operating model one, it's uh, quite different in the movement from three to two as compared to the other, other operating models. But you know, the um, part of showing this is to show that we're trying to capture that structural uncertainty or unknowns about movement. And these operating models are um showing differences in movement between them all so it's trying to capture that uncertainty that we have there so in the future and as a reminder the srb recommended reconditioning the operating model when the stock assessment has changed significantly so we're on sort of the three-year schedule the stock assessment will likely be a full stock assessment every three years uh, and then we'll recondition the operating model at that point. That way, it's sort of the uh, Doug Butterworth taught me many years ago, got to cut that operating model off at some point because I could play with it forever. <laughs> and you got to start working on what you're actually going to do with the, with the management strategy evaluation. So we're planning to um, call this the operating model, which we'll do simulations from for, say, the next two or three years. Yeah. Frequently. Yeah. That just gets too good. It's it's hard for me too. I just, <laughs> you, know. well, you can make it better. I know. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, this is a operating model it's capturing the dynamics of Pacific how that has structural uncertainty in it. Um, and is a good representation of it for harvest policy. So that's it on the operating models. I'd like to move on to uh, just to review the objectives and performance metrics, and then a little bit of talk about um, another SRB recommendation here. So as a reminder, there's uh, four priority coastwide objectives that the commission has decided on, and they really like to keep this a small manageable set of objectives that they can easily understand. And that's maintaining long-term spawning biomass above 20%, uh, maintaining above this reference point of B36%, and then optimizing coastwide TCY, and then limiting annual changes in the coastwide TCY. 
And um, at the work meeting, we began working with the commissioners on ways that they can really use these objectives and analyze them to decide on different management procedures, looking at trade offs and things like that. But we had a um, one question, you know, we we're thinking about results of the last annual meeting where they decided to depart from the um, current interim management strategy um, where the the reference SPR recommended a coast wide uh, TCY around 52 million pounds, and the commission decided to set the coast wide TCY at 37, 38, so, so, so somewhere around there, a million pounds. And um, so we're trying to figure out well, was there an additional objective to consider? So we, we, we I'll present to you what we, our thoughts on that would be, um, and then the outcomes of the, what the initial thoughts of the commission were. But uh, related to the SRB recommendation is a region specific objective to conserve spatial structure that's informative of changes in biomass within a region. Um, and we'll review some of that too, here, some work that we've done. So first, um, this additional objective, is there additional objective that would be helpful to the commission to um, find a management procedure that would maybe even reflect the decision that they were making at the 99th annual meeting. As I mentioned, they departed from that management procedure choosing uh, 36.97 million pounds instead of 52. Um, and down here in that um, smaller text, as the commission noted that the adoptive mortality limits correspond to a 38% probability of stock decline and a 36% probability of stock decline through 2026. But they also made a note prior to that that the um, FIS index was at one of its lowest values in the time series and, and it was a, had a trend of declining. They noted um, fishery CPUE was at a low also. And so there were all these sort of concepts. So we thought here, is there a desire to sort of maintain the long-term coastwide spawning biomass at a level that is above what we saw in 2023? Or is there some even just reference absolute spawning violence that they want to maintain that um, but it above with some probability? So <clears throat> thinking about that and phrasing the objective as in that first bullet, we thought, well, this would be could be a useful objective. We're currently using dynamic reference points. So maintaining it above B20%, B30%, 6% are both dynamic in that it's accounting for changes in weighted age and recruitment. And having an absolute level might be something that's useful contrast to dynamic um, reference points. Um, some people you know, are concerned that you can just spiral downward. That's not the case here. But having that absolute sort of threshold will keep you above, above that level. Um, it would have meaning to stakeholders and could be an indicator of efficiency. If, if you're maintaining the spawning biomass of some above some level, it could maintain CPUE above some level as well. So we did a lot of runs. Uh, this is the, uh, the typical table we present with um, those, um, well, there's the two priority objectives, the 20% and the 36% at the top on the, under long-term metrics. And then we've put in this new metric, probability of spawning biomass less than the spawning biomass in 2023. And then we have the short-term metrics, the TCY and the variability in TCY across different SPR values in this table. And let me see if I think I called out a couple of things. Yeah. So if we were if we're looking at the 20%, they all pass. All, all of these different SPR levels pass. And that's because there's a control rule in here that reduces uh, the um, SPR or reduces the fishing intensity between 30 and 20%. But if we're just looking at the objective of 36%, that would put us in the range of 40 to 42% SPR values. Um, and then if we are, let me see, Yeah, there is a pointer. So, so yeah, that would put us in the SPR values of 40, 42%. If we were to look at this additional objective of maintaining the spawning biomass above the spawning biomass in 2023, and I just picked an ad hoc value of 20%, maintaining it above with a 20% probability, that would slide us up to 
Um, so it's just giving the, the commission an idea how these different objectives would work. And then you would um, maybe look at the trade-offs between yield and variability. Noting in the past, the MSAB has talked about sort of a threshold around 15% variability year to year. Although that isn't specified specifically, we have used that in the past. So if we were to try to reduce variability, we would be up in the 52% um, SDR. So walking the commission through that, um, at the work meeting, there were suggestions that, yeah, this really wasn't an objective on our table. We just had concerns and we wanted to act precautionary. And so there wasn't a lot of appetite for this additional objective. But I still feel it's a useful objective as sort of like this threshold, like if we're continuing to decline, what's the probability that we would continue to decline or some objective related to that? It really seems to get at something we talked about before, which is, you know, how much they would actually follow and think this if the management is mm -hmm. if they have unstated objectives um, and then that's the threshold and you're not including those. Right. Then yeah, the MSC is not accurately representing what what's likely to happen under a that management procedure is actually applied. Yes, I, I agree. And, and and so we're working on trying to identify those unstated objectives. It's just they they weren't they couldn't clearly state why they made those decisions. Um, and so we're trying to find ways to maybe help them out, at least to justify reasons for departing from the management procedure. So they can not only justify their reason for departing, you know, we don't want to go below this threshold or something. And this is our reasons looking at the MSC results, you know, we go to a higher SPR or whatever, but also trying to understand, um, maybe help them understand where their decisions might be coming. But yeah, they they weren't ready to accept an objective like this. At this time. Yeah, I wonder if this gets into the exceptional circumstances things that we yeah. talked about before. I mean, do they talk about that in terms of well, there was an exceptional circumstance that decided to depart there? Yeah, so we uh, we did have that that discussion with them as well at the work meeting, as well as the, the MSAB as well um, earlier in the year, and. Um, they're, they're starting to understand the difference between an exceptional circumstance and sort of a, what we're, I think we're calling an unusual event or something like that. Um, but they, they really don't want to give up that um, ability to make those decisions. So I think we just got to work add, with that. Basically to add noise. Mm -hmm. So, so <laughs> that, that's what we do in all these simulations that, as well. This is the opposite to what they've done histor like historically, this stuff, the analysis that you did showing directional bias and error, right? This is now the opposite. Reducing this is going the other direction. Yeah. They used to tend to set them high. <clears throat> now they set them That's true. Yeah. It's just noise. It's just adding noise to this thing. The current trend is totally consistent with the management objective. Like the stock is not in a critical condition right, by right. any means. Right. <laughs> it, everything is, there's nothing exceptional about this. This is all very predictable. Mm -hmm. So, like Doug, you know, says, cut off your operating model. My advice, is like, cut off your objectives, <laughs> because now, yeah, there's so many ways, so many dimensions to this. Going in, anything can happen yeah. next year. But it, what it suggests to me is there that is that the thirty six percent is is not going to be there. on the table. No. <laughs> and, so and the, the, that's, I, rather yeah. than have two objectives, I would say, well, then, then just modify the B thirty six one. Because if if you're kind of approaching something that people are not comfortable with, right, then you're you're kind of near, mm -hmm. regardless that it's the biological, you know, optimum. I don't know what mm -hmm. stands for. Yeah, we we're we were wondering too if there might be a. An industry objective, and and you know the, the the commissioners haven't totally thrown this away. They definitely they, they want to hear from the SRB about objectives like this, as well as the MSAP. You know the the more industry side of, of things, and um, because we thought this is like a proxy for efficiency or opportunity for the fleet as well, in that it can it can be maybe it's um, correlated with CPUE or um, how 
much quota, even the recreational sector, that how many days they can be open per year, per week, or something like that. And maintaining that spine biomass at higher levels than what B36 would, would suggest might be a, a different objective or a, a additional objective. Yeah, well, it's very consistent with maximum economic yield. Mm -hmm. When you, one of your objectives is to optimize the yield, are you going to do it biological optimum or economic optimum? Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's more towards the economic optimum. So, yeah. this could be a perfectly rational thing to do. Is, have a target around this level rather than mm -hmm. yeah we just need to figure out what that that's a hard thing to figure out but yeah. gosh you can do that <laughs> <laughs> in her spare time right but even if you don't need to calculate it specifically yeah. it, it's, it's a valid thing mm -hmm. maybe that's what you're seeing and so when we the 36 percent comes from an analysis where we determined msy was about at b30 percent and then we took in the literature MEY is often 1.2 times the um, the BMSY, and so that's how we came up with the 36 percent, along with some other justifications that the MSF one um, had as well. Way well, more tricky with the prices fluctuate. Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, I guess it depends what MEY papers you're looking for too. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the as well. Oh yeah. Yeah, and, and I think and certainly the, the recreational sector is a little higher. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um it, it's interesting because I think you know you have catch rates in a commercial fishery, you have days open in a recreational sector or size limits, you know, and things like that. Just getting people out to your to your lodge or whatever. So what you've done here is taking your thirty twenty rule that changed. Maximum. Right. That, that, that's essentially one thing. I have a slide on that. What I'm, what I'm thinking is, what if you shifted it so that they're on the ramp? Mm -hmm. like they just ramped down. So, what if you, instead of changing the, the absolute SPR, shift the position yep. so that you implement the ramp that they just did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and that was one thing. I think that's on the next slide. Is a suggestion is you could do this through the control rule, the thirty twenty control rule, or you could add in a second control rule that is you have one based on relative spawning biomass, one based on absolute level spawning biomass, which gets confusing. I know. <laughs> well, I, I mean, in some sense, that ratio of the, the the recommended to the actual quota there gives you the slope. Um, mm. that brand. Right. So that, that's their applied control. That's true. Yeah. It's a good way to look at it. I think that one of the most important things here is just to communicate to them that, you know, to the extent that you can accurately capture their process, the mm -hmm. MSC provides good advice. Mm -hmm. To the extent that they deviate from the stated process, the MSC is no longer a road to how that's going to perform. Yeah. Because that's not being tested. The MSC. That's, right. That's not the, you know, the harvest strategy. Mm -hmm. The harvest strategy is this with exceptions under some ill defined circumstances. Right? Yeah. And the risk is you get something like what Pacific Herring Managers were doing, which is running the MSC every year. Right. Doing the stock assessment and then running the MSC every single year to see what the harvest rate should be. Right. It's point. Yeah, it's it's point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it reduce the amount of turgidity yeah, yeah. and everything mm -hmm. else. Yeah. Yeah. They could be reacting to a random data point. Right. Yes. So what we did present to the commission was, I, we presented this plot as well, which is, this is just those probabilities of being less than that spawning bomb mass in 2023. This is nearly linear, this range of SPR values showing the 43% in the light of color. Um, and then we talked to them a little bit about the trade offs between like variability in yield and the TCY in yield to show them, you know, that that's not a linear process, that there are SPR values there where a change in the SPR results in a large change in the TCY and little change in the. Um, in the AAV, but then you also get to a point where you're really just changing the variability in the yield with little change in the actual yield. So 
for the realized yield. So we, we, it, it was it was a good exercise. Um, and then we thought, you know, what are the the ways to create a management procedure to meet an objective if this was an additional objective? Um, and we talked about, you know, you could just change your SPR, find the SPR value, 44% or whatever it is that meets that objective. Create a control rule, like I said, or modify the control rule, like you were suggesting, um, or actually create a control rule related to um, FIS WPE or something like that. But that that's you know brings in complication, as Ian said earlier, trying to explain a lot of these complicated things. Well, that's onerous. You think the FIS one does? Well, I would say that is of the first two are abstract. Mm -hmm. and you've got to convince a bunch of non-modelers about modeling concepts, whereas the FIS is like it went up ten percent, it went down ten percent. Everybody can get that. And that's what you're saying, right? You they, yeah. you're looking for a concrete thing. That you, it could be. Yeah, it's just if we were to add that as a second control rule on the second the third, yeah. This and is what so, we've been suggesting yeah. all along. It's like just make a data empirical arms control yeah so this is a really good stepping stone towards that multi-year assessment that we've been talking about and that's sort of the next thing that we're hoping to to, to do the, the commission's very interested in that so we haven't done that quite yet focusing on the operating model getting a couple of things out of the way but i think that's going to be my next task which i'll present at the end but um but yeah so so these are the thoughts we've been having and um just presenting to the commission and would like to have a discussion with the NSAB, which would the management strategy advisory board, which would probably happen next May. Um, so if it's okay, I'll move on to a, the, the other objective. And this comes from a recommendation. Um, uh, well, it's not a recommendation, I guess. It was just a note from the SRB. Um, we've talked about, we currently have a spatial structure objective. So this isn't a priority objective, but it's one of these regional objectives that's in there. Um, and when, what that regional objective currently is the proportion of spawning biomass in each region is above some threshold. And we define those thresholds in an ad hoc manner, looking at historical stock distribution. The previous operating models and their simulations, even without fishing, could not meet the objective for region 4B. So that, you know, it was like maintaining about 2% of the total spawning biomass on the coast, and it just could never meet it. There was some probability of it going below. The interesting thing now with this operating model, and I guess this different M's and, and different, maybe even movement rates are estimated. Um, it's hard to see on this plot, but the gray area is the threshold for that objective. And then the colored area is the, uh, the simulation results at, I think this was with a 43%, can't remember, but it, it, it also met at 43% or no fishing, but it always met it now. It actually never even had any probability of dipping below that 2%. So a little change in the operating model, understanding of the stock actually could meet that objective now. But nevertheless, um, there was the note at the SRB about you know maybe having in a, a spatial structure objective that's more related to the actual biomass in each region instead of a proportion, because you change a proportion over in region two, that affects the proportion in 4B. So they're all correlated to some. Yeah, I, when I looked at this, uh, I thought, well, actually, this kind of makes, the way you could use it is that as long as it's above the threshold, don't worry. Right. And that's what we were hoping, but it was never above the threshold. Now it before. is. Now it is. Now it's. Yeah. And so it's just, it's, it's a big, <laughs> I know. You changed the model. Yes. <laughs> I know. It's just, um, yeah. We, but, but I just wanted to bring it up because this was something the SRB noted. But so, so we did look at this. And what it, it, which was actually really interesting to look at as well. So we we calculated the relative spawning biomass within each region. So because the way the operating model works, we we actually simulate what's called a shadow state, and that state of the population unfished without fishing. 
and and so it gets the exact same parameters except without fishing than the simulation of the state with fishing so you can make those comparisons uh, to unfished really easily um and so within each region we're able to calculate that relative spawning biomass relative to what it would look like if it wasn't fished i've just put some lines on there it might be hard to see the 20 percent the 30 percent and the 36 percent just as reference points there for each of these different regions not to say that those are the best reference points for a region um but you can see some big differences especially at the end of the time series i was a little concerned at the beginning of the time series and talking with ian about this um you know we thought that's it's really just burning in the model there um you know is trying to start it at some equilibrium in 1950 something after fishing occurred and it makes sense region two was quite depressed it had a lot of fishing in the 20s and 30s and that was one reason we start in the 50s is there was that bottleneck in the 1930s that it just had to get through it was driving movement rates um so we weren't too concerned about the beginning because there's a lot of uncertainty but you know looking at sort of these in the projection period two this is about current right there um Looking at the projection period, you can see where these populations are stabilizing within each region. Um, so we thought it was a, um, a really interesting exercise. It's a really interesting output, but we don't have any idea what are appropriate thresholds for an objective like this. What do we want to maintain it above? Region two, you know, it's a, it's a sink area. It's a lot of biomass is coming from other areas into that region. So can it be more depressed? Probably. We could do simulations to see when things might go to really low levels or extinct, but we just haven't defined thresholds at this time. It's a sink area relative to recruitment, so spawning in region two doesn't contribute. Um, <clears throat> spawning in region two in this model would contribute because spawning is just aggregated into a coast-wide level, produces a bunch of recruits that are then distributed. A very small amount of recruits go to region two, but over the lifetime, as you saw, the fish have a high probability of moving from the Bering Sea to region two, and they typically move in that direction rather than moving back. I just want to clarify, yeah. I thought a sink from recruitment was oh. contributing. Yeah. yeah. But if it was a true sink from a recruitment perspective, the objective is zero. Right. You just fish about because they're not contributing. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 exactly. Right. So, yes, they are contributing. So, it's important to have biomass there for sure. And, um, yeah, so so th that's where we're at with, with that um, note by the SRB is, you know, we took a look at this. We can calculate it. We can calculate it as an objective, but we just – we don't know how to determine a threshold at this time. We didn't put much more thought into it at this time because the other spatial objective passes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it's twelve oh six. I'll just keep going on here. I think we're breaking at twelve thirty for lunch. Okay, so there was a recommendation um, to improve the comparability of the MPs in performance for achieving TCY objectives. The SRB recommended equalizing the MP performance on one of the conservation objectives. Uh, and I view this personally as a way of reducing the axis, axes of those different objectives. Um, so with that 3020 control rule in there, the the 20 percent objective really just could never be achieved exactly we couldn't get it at a five percent threshold it's always less than one percent and that's because fishing intensity is always ramped down before you get to a low enough stock size to, to do this so we saw that in that previous table over the range of spr values so what we did here and i'm showing an spr 34 percent 30 percent the green and the blue are with a um 3020 control rule on it and then the red has no 3020 control rule. so you can see it still takes a pretty high spr value or pretty high fishing intensity low spr without a control rule to meet that objective so this would be um this is a five percent the tail end of this line is five percent so when that tail end of that line touches the 20 percent dashed line that would be meeting the objective exactly 
Um, so to do to equalize on the 20% objective would take um, a very high fission intensity. So, but what about the 36%? We saw that in the previous table, we could, and that'd be an SPR around 41%. Um, but from conversations with the MSAB, they're really uncomfortable going to that high of a fishing intensity. <laughs> they want to hang out more in that 43 to 46%. Um, so here it, it takes an SPR of 41% to get to be 36. Yes. So this came up with way back when we first started looking at this as being our values and stuff. It's, it's at that time we came up with SPR in the 50s. To reach 36%? No, but it was like it, effectively the fishery was operating in a right SPR in the 50s. It seemed like at the time. Yeah, I think there was a lot of desire, and, and that could be because of the variability in the TCY. Where they wanted that variability low enough, would you'd have to operate in the SPR at 50%. But the fishery, I mean, <laughs> we had that one meeting, we went back and forth with the MSAP. You know, look, we can fish at an SPR 38% and meet all of your objectives. And I'm like, we don't want to do that. <laughs> and it was like, what's the additional objective underlying that? That they're more comfortable in that range around 43, 46% SPR. There's, you know, and maybe it's trust in the MSC process. Maybe it's, you know, just going slow towards those levels. I don't know. But, but we can do it on the 36% objective. And then, we also thought, well, if there is this objective related to some threshold absolute spawning biomass, it would be pretty easy to, to equalize on that one as well. So we could do it, um, but we have not um, pursued that any further. Yeah, so so that's, that's all that I had on equalizing MP uh, performance on an objective. I'm curious whether the yeah, we haven't presented it to them at this time. We've had just the one meeting in May, which was before the June meeting where this was brought up. So we'll present the, it to them in May um, as a method um, for this. But um, it's it's interesting how quickly they've gravitated towards, you know, what does SPR mean? and equalizing objectives uh, over 36% would would sort of almost take us would take SPR out of the equation as well. And it would just be our SPRs what it is to equalize that. And then we'd look at the other objectives, which which I think is a useful way, but it might take some convincing to get them away from thinking that 43%, you know, that that's their their anchor right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's lots of different things that you can equalize on mm -hmm. and that really is uh it's something that i think it's the MSAB, yeah uh, what they what they want to use is the equal play and that, okay. that should reflect their priorities and what's important mm -hmm. also what's possible with equal operating as well. right you know, if, if there's something that they all agree to do any rule that we're going to consider it has to be this oh right that's a good candidate for right being the equalizing objective Mm -hmm. It should be fairly robust, too. Like if trying to equalize on a five percent probability. Yeah, you're better off aiming for something where, like thirty six, where you're aiming at the median or something. Like that. If they were to say like we wanted fifteen percent variability in yield or something, would that be a useful one as well? If we had a more defined objective on variability. Anything that they agree is something they want all the time. Yeah. To do. Okay. Yeah, we'll have that discussion. I think it's partly related to what management procedures we're investigating as well. Like if they're stuck on 42%, then the levers are where you put the ramp. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That, that helps me a lot. Should we move on from this one into the FIST design scenarios? So, okay, so there were a re was a request and a recommendation. These are both of them in italics up there. Um, 
from last SRB related to using the MSE to investigate this data scenarios. Um, <clears throat> and, and then, as I noted earlier, this came at the end of the report under those management supporting um, heading. So we used the MSE with the new operating model to investigate effects produced this effort. Um, and we defined how reduced FIS effort affects data and assessment variability. Um, and we're really seeing this as a pilot study at this time. We I had, um, well, the quantitative sciences group here had discussions about how to implement this in the MSE. And we came up with some good rules of thumb and I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then we learned that the um, reduction in the survey may be more than we even imagined. So, <laughs> um, so we had to, wow, we, we probably not, we thought we had bookends, but there was another shelf was put on the end. So, <laughs> um, so what we came up with was um, there's three different types of designs for a regulatory area. And in like say 2C, you could have a full design, which is sufficient stations to get your target CV. You could have a reduced design where you're not surveying it full, you know, all the stations or a large number of stations, but you're reducing those stations. So your CV may become above target over time. So the CV would increase to some level. And then you could have a mixed where you just totally miss the area. You don't survey the area in that year. And then the CV would, of course, go to as high as possible CV um, increase. So at that time, and this was before um, Dr. Webster Ray had done um, his analysis, which he'll present to the SRB on what are the CVs looking like when you miss these years. So we had this discussion and I put in some numbers and then Ray will present to you what those numbers actually are. So that's why we're seeing this as a pilot. This is, you know, preliminary. And so we came up with ranges, CVs ranging in these values on this top two rows for a full design in a regulatory area. So say 2C, if you were doing a full design every year, it'd go down to 6%. But if you start missing a couple, it could range up to 10%. Um, and so you'll see how we actually implement these ranges. Reduced higher CVs, but still, you know, they're relatively low, maybe near target. Um, and it, it sort of has a linear ramp or some, yeah, I think it was a linear ramp that changes as you keep missing or you keep reducing surveys. It ramps between this upper and lower range in there. And then the missed, uh, missing a, a survey in a regulatory area has a higher ramp and higher CVs, so it can change quicker. Um, and I think what we found is that missing even a few years resulted for some regulatory areas and CVs higher than what the max is here. So this is why we're seeing this as a preliminary study, which we can refine quite easily with um, new results. So we have those different types, um, and these are the actual scenarios um, that we've put in. And they're, they're lettered A, B, and E because we had more, but then we just decided to present these three different scenarios, um, where A is sort of like the optimistic best you can do. It's a full design in every IPHC regulatory area every year. So you're getting those minimum CVs. And then B is um, reduced designs for other IPC regulatory areas other than 2B and 2C. So 2B and 2C have full designs all the time. That's the core that we're considering. And then other regulatory areas have reduced designs. So they're gonna have increased CVs. And then E is missed every other year for everything other than um, 2B and 2C and 3A. And then 2B, 2C are always full. 3A is reduced, um, always reduced. So you never do anything in there. So it's just trying to get a, a range. We thought this was bookends, but it looks like there might even be two years missed in some regulatory areas and other things like that. So these are really small plots, but we just wanted to show you uh, these are the different scenarios. A, remember, is always full. B is uh, reduced and E has some missed areas. And then each row is a different regulatory area. Um, and so really the key here is under the column A, everything's at their minimum values. 
So these lines are all at that minimum CV. And then under E, you can see it oscillates because it's missing a year and then it does a survey and then it misses a year. And so it's sort of bouncing between those. Um, and my little ramping idea never really worked. It just sort of jumped between the CVs. But it, it at least gives us a picture of effect on the CV of the survey. Now the CVs, these individual CVs are going to be most uh, influential on the stock distribution estimate. And that's going into the management procedure. But then uh, the CVs are um, weighted to, to create a coast-wide CV that would be used in the stock assessment. But the way the MSE is currently working is the stock assessment isn't specifically modeled by entering data into it and running a model. It's currently simulated through estimation error and TCY. And that's because stock synthesis it's just really hard to replicate an ensemble stock assessment in a decent amount of time. It would just take a lot of simulation time to do that. And we couldn't come up, we, we've, we tried, and I haven't tried in a while, but we just couldn't get a good opera, a good model for an estimation model. We could do something more simple, thought about like a delay difference or something like that to capture the effects. But we feel that the simulation method is capturing some of that, the the estimation error effects pretty well. And we've talked about this years ago. So right now, the MSE has been simulating error in the total mortality and the relative spawning biomass, which is used for the control rule, um, with a CV of 15% on both of those. Correlation between the two of them, a 0.5 based on a study. So it's a multi, it's a bivariate normal distribution we simulate from. And then it has an autocorrelation in there assessment would have some sort of correlation and, and those numbers are all based on a lot of work we did well, that was five years ago i think already um <clears throat> and so what we thought well let's let's just say that the estimation error increases as the cvs from the fist increase so we did something really simple at this point in time is ad hoc the cv has a minimum value of 15 percent for estimation error and that just ramps up to 21.5% um, as these CVs get for the coast wide CV on the FIS. So we just increase the estimation error as so the coast wide CV. So that's the estimation error in the biomass coming out of the stock system. Right. It, it's the estimation error in actually the, the total mortality. So the you have it, you know what the total mortality would be given an SPR, and then you add error to that. Um, and then the relative spawning biomass, you do the same thing. The same oh, relative spawning biomass is 48%. But then we add a little error to account for what the assessment thinks it would actually be. But those are really low CVs compared to results from that analysis for stock assessments. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, 100% CVs. Yeah. So, for example, Mid Atlantic Council uses spins of 60%, 100%, 150%. Holy cow. So we're buffering away from scientific uncertainty. Yep. And uh, that 60% level that analysis suggests that's probably too low. Oh, wow. That's how good Ian is. These numbers are based on analysis of past assessments, but that was a pretty limited set of assessments that we could really work with. So it's probably time to redo this. It's a super hard thing to yeah to actually quantify right uh, mm -hmm. when you can quantify uncertainty uh conditional on the assessment being an accurate representation of dynamics right that's like if we got everything this we got everything right yeah you know, yeah certain is this right yeah so that's, that's exactly that's yeah yeah it, it, it'd be worthwhile to take a look at this again have an investigation of this i always imagined i'd actually go down the other route of trying to get an actual estimation model in somehow but i just haven't had the time to do that it, but there are two. I mean, you have to make some assumptions <clears throat> about how properties of the mm -hmm. simulation. Right? Exactly. If you match them well, it's going to be underestimated. If you match yeah. them poorly, the sky's the limit. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's the simulation time as well. Adding to that, in. so we just did an analysis of interassessment uncertainty. So okay, assessment from one 
the, the, the uncertainty from one assessment to the next in estimation of the same quantity. So yep. 2002 SSB. Um, what mm -hmm. does one assessment say about that quantity? What does the next assessment say? I find that variability. And that, not surprisingly, really varies by region, depending on how willing assessment scientists are to open up the box again every, yeah. every year. Or if a new scientist takes over the assessment. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but for regions where there is a you know, pretty, pretty big um, reopening of the assessment, the assessment periods, um, 60 to 100%. Yeah, if you're, um, if you're in Europe, they have it all figured out. Since they're running assessments every year, they touch nothing. That you do. Right. For the ICS assessments, uh, yeah. the, those CDs are super low. And that could be the case here, too. Um, and I, Steve Ralston did a similar study years ago. Although that's also using a single best assessment paradigm, where we're using an ensemble of assessments. So we have in any in any one year, we might have one model go up, one model go down, and the next year, the other model. You know, so we're actually getting some central tendency yeah. out of an ensemble that's going to dampen this to some degree yeah. Well, yeah. compared to single models. Yeah, so I think the key point here is is these really are ad hoc numbers that we put in for at least the ramping up to 21.5% as you reduce FIS. But we've seen the um, assessment really does track well with the FIS WPOE. Um, and so as the CV goes, you know, pretty wild on that FIS, if you start missing areas, we might, you know, do some sensitivities, at least ramping up these numbers or other things like that, or actually take a, another good analysis of this. Any advice is appreciated. As I said, this is a preliminary pilot study and really looking for some feedback. I think I can finish the FIST design scenarios real quick before lunch here. So <clears throat> we do have some preliminary results from, um, from <clears throat> this pilot study and being um, within this set of parameters, within the design scenarios, A being full survey everywhere every year, and then E being missing every other year in some regulatory areas. Um, and we have plotted the results. Really, the only that the most major outcome here is in the variability in the TCUI from year to year within a regulatory area. So each plot we're showing here is a regulatory area. We're showing the TCY along the x-axis and the variability along the y-axis. And so you can see the points, um, and these are the, the performance metrics from those priority objectives with fifth and 95th uh, percent quantiles on them. And you see it's when we start missing those surveys that the um, in some of these areas, the variability increases quite a bit. Um, and that, and it's not to say that other factors um, would not be affected, but you know, as we introduce maybe different FIST design scenarios, it might show a difference in the TCY among these as well, or even more estimation errors. But it's really these preliminary results saying it's translating in that variability. So uh, as I said, you know. Um, upcoming designs are likely to have even higher CVs than we've simulated here. So this is really, even in the near future, this could be the reality could be outside these results. So we're looking to do this some more and continue work on this. Um, should I forge on a little bit here? We're almost done with this. I think there's only like four more slides or so. Um, yeah. Okay. Another five minutes or sure. Takes. Yeah. So um, the SRB, I didn't reproduce them here. There's a lot of discussion about exceptional circumstances, which was great. I think this is something that the commission's interested in and um, we're all learning about and understanding more, but it's time for us to, to define how the commission will deal with exceptional circumstances in the MSC context. So um, some things that the SRB at the 22nd last June mentioned was uh, annually comparing simulated MSV values to FIS estimates. 
um, distinguishing exceptional circumstance from unusual conditions, which you've already mentioned. Um, there's a persistence necessary to declare an exceptional circumstance. It has to maybe happen two years to see that instead of just sort of um, declaring something that was just a one-off. <clears throat> and then um, the SRB has a process of reviewing that and, de and helping declare an exceptional circumstance. So some of the possibilities that we've been thinking about is using the coastwide all sizes FIS, WPUE, or NPUE um, from that space-time model and seeing if that falls outside of the simulated distribution that the MSE has been looking at. So is that, you know, and if that occurs in two or more years. So just looking at the, the data that's been realized and looking at this operating model and seeing is it outside of the, the range, some um, distribution. We can use the all sizes stock distribution to do the same thing. And, I, and as I mentioned earlier, we're conditioning on that stock distribution because it's an important aspect of the management procedures. So that might be a useful one as well. And then we put a third bullet here, just is there some biological observations or new research that's indicating the operating model might be outside? Like if, if maturity analysis comes in and says, well, you guys got maturity all wrong. <laughs> That might okay. We need to redo the operating model. So, you you, you, you yes, in, yeah, um, yeah, and improve the operating and see what happens. Oh, okay, before you jump, yeah, see if it does have a big effect on the outcome of the management procedures rather than declaring the circumstance itself. Yes, and that's why we would have your involvement. So, so th these are some of the, and maybe we can add another bullet to this now, uh, potential actions if exceptional circumstances is declared. Um, one thing is if we are in a multi-year assessment process, if it happens in a year without a stock assessment, that stock assessment would be completed as soon as possible. Um, we've chosen that language specifically, not to say in that year, but as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> consult with the SRB and the MSAB to identify why that could occur and this could, um, what could be done to resolve it? And this could be where, you know, we just put it in and see if it does make a difference. Um, and then determine a set of MPs to evaluate with an updated ON. And then further consult with the MSAB and the SRB after simulations are complete to identify a new management procedure if appropriate. So this is obviously a multi-year process that would take, um, two years to declare an exceptional circumstance and probably another two to three to actually get through all the simulations. So I think that's what I have on exceptional circumstances, um, just working towards that. And then the final slide here is just uh, potential management procedures to evaluate. And we've put them into sort of what we think are priorities, uh, secondary and then additional being um, annual multi-year stock assessments. That's something the commission brought up at the 99th annual meeting. Um, looking at different fishing intensity values, that's important. Um, so it'd be good to talk to the MSAB about that. But um, that seems to be the axis that most people are thinking about, is adjusting fishing intensity. And then looking at FIS uh, design scenarios, which is something the commission is interested in as well. It, it actually came up before we I brought up the MSE results. They thought, could we use the MSE to do this? So that's great. So they're seeing this as a useful product. Um, some secondary ones is what the MSAB has brought up. And just interrupt before that, but that puts even more pressure on getting the scale of potential um, impacts right. Yes. Because you'd hate for this to be a tool to encourage them in yeah, false confidence in reducing the this. Like, yes. Like, hey, it doesn't even matter. And that's why we really noted <clears throat> this as being a pilot study. So, was there a comment online or a question? Um, this is Kim. I just wonder, given that the level <clears throat> of assessment uncertainty is greater in some management units and others uh the likelihood of environmental change coincidentally might be also higher in certain areas is there a need for different criteria for exceptional circumstances in different regions
Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, we could use maybe the stock distribution could be something that begins to get at the different regions, but yeah, we could think about that. I mean, you could, you could look at your, like your first condition, all sizes, WPV, coastwide, mm -hmm. you could also look at it by region. Mm -hmm. And I think stock distribution would get at that a little bit, because that is by region or even regulatory area. And I think that, that's also a really good reason to define exceptional circumstances based on confidence intervals of projections, right? Because yeah. that, that will that will inherently get at that uncertainty you know an exceptional circumstance in a highly variable area that would have a, a higher bar just because yes. of that, right? so if yes. you're looking at the 95 percent confidence an exceptional circumstance has to be really weird yeah in a place where it's yeah i mean th i think that would be something great for the srb to indicate in the report if they feel that we should work on that as well but i'm certainly interested in I'm also wondering about you know, how much you want to rely on the ECE for things that could be done more effectively. So looking at different fist designs, you're just you're just changing CVs in an estimation model that is essentially unbiased. It's got some autocorrelation in it, but you're really just messing with variability. You're not really looking at bias and persistent right. effects. What you could do is look at FIST designs and how they impact the assessment itself. So you could do some simulation estimation work with these standalone assessment to see how the assessment is affected. You know, because yeah. then you're going to see bias popping up probably yeah. in there. Certain certain members of the ensemble yeah. might start to behave differently. Yeah, stuff like that. More of a simulation experiment with the assessment. With the, than I would do. It, I would start with the assessment rather than making the MSCB a do all for everything. Right. It's not really. Like, you, know, you kind of know what it's going to say. It's yeah. just the, the details of how much of everything is added. Mm -hmm. I still do want to bring it back into MSC at some point. But one, <clears throat> one of the ensembles was. What does that actually mean for performance? Right, and, and then you could parameterize your estimation yep. component to have some different behavior to it. Yeah, and, and the way the commission phrased their interest in this was, what is the effect of reduced or, or changes in the FIST design on management outcomes? And so that was where you know, I think the MSC could be useful. But I think it, exactly correct is we want to understand the effect on the estimation error and how and then parameterize that appropriately in the MSE starting with the assessment if you're trying to represent the estimation process in mm -hmm. closed loop simulations yeah if, if you're going to simulate a miracle uh, kind of rule you can skip a lot of stuff yeah right it, it's only all you need to deal with is the catchability <clears throat> Converting the fist to a violence yep. and a catch. So, you could look at, for example, based on different fist designs, how does the stock assessment estimate of the catchability, the scale, or whatever it's going to be, how is that affected? Yep. And, and represent it that way. It's though, I mean, you're never going to. Let's say put in an empirical harvest control rule and use it for the next however many years you're simulating, right? Right. That, that's not realistic. Uh, you are going to update it periodically. So there's this thing like you can't put too much weight on the overall projections, mm -hmm. knowing that you are going to be controlling this thing yeah. along the way. Yeah. And just let it be what it is. Like assume your assessment's going to do a good job of doing that. Right. Every few years. Yeah. Unless it's like we did one recently for Greenland Halibut. Oh, the, did you ever do that? No. No. Was, but I um, had the chance. With Greenland Halibut, we did that. We simulated a, an empirical where the catchability uh, was revised every three years by simulating a full stock assessment oh, okay. every three years. Because the question was like, 
how many years before this survey becomes useful because it was a new survey. Ah. You have an existing plan that's pretty well dialed in already. This one like kind of burns in over a period of you know, 12 right. to 15 years. Right. Well, one thing I'm pretty really excited about is um, crossing these multi-year stock assessment management procedures with these FIS design reductions and seeing if an empirical rule if that helps or hinders or you know whatever, because then it'll be more dependent on the actual just survey results and that empirical rule. So I think yeah, it's going to pump your the variability that's going to be yeah. under reduced designs. It's going to go direct. Yeah, it's going right in. Yeah. But then that, now it's going through this quasi assessment yeah. procedure that doesn't really and so match we, anything. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So we probably do have to be careful <laughs> about that comparison to an annual assessment to a multi-year assessment and that there's a more direct link to that empirical rule to the actual reduction in the FIST design. And the annual assessment might be a little bit over-optimistic. It's unbiased, it's, you know, all these other things. So, yeah. Speaking of bias, I mean, it looks like the scenarios you've looked at so far are all done with the CVs. Um, mm -hmm. you know, Gray is always talking about the this design as, you know, limiting the scope for potential bias emerging. Yep. So I think it'd be interesting too to look at what the scale of that bias might be. Yeah, years after missed, uh, missed full focus. Plan. Yeah, and I think the analysis that he's recently completed and will present to you tomorrow, I believe, will be really informative for this. Ben, yeah. as well. right. This is actually the last slide. I just want to say the secondary points are coming from the MSAB. And that's some constraints on the TCY and smoothing of stock distribution to reduce variability. Um, and then the additional are some other ones that we thought might be useful, but um, that's if the objective on spawning biomass came in, maybe we could have elements like a control rule on WPWE or something like that. Um, and then uh, TCY distribution procedures reminding the commission that they have not don't have an agreed distribution procedure and we're willing to help however we can. <laughs> um, and so with that, and we, we, I can always happy to come back to anything after lunch if you want, but this is the last slide, just um, some potential things for the SRB to think about. Um, it's basically everything that I've presented on the operating model objectives, exceptional circumstances, things like that. So this is just a summary of basically what I presented. And that's it for me. Cool. Uh, has there been some indication of when commissioners you know, want to make a decision on an MP? Or is that I haven't. Um, I haven't heard. But offered as much help as I can give them. A lot of people are looking forward to it. The MSAB made a statement that they felt like subsequent i think they phrased it as subsequent to an agreement on distribution is when we should start examining management procedures so um you know that the msab's not too keen on it doing much until there's an agreement on distribution because it typically just gets in there. it's it's a lot of variability and a lot of discussion points there's not an agreement in place um so and i yeah so yeah i haven't heard Distribution of TCY. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing we are working on as well um, is updating the harvest strategy policy document, which will help us identify areas that need to be worked on in the harvest strategy policy. Um, so, you know, identifying the gaps like distribution, things like that um, could help focus us in on the work as well. Do you want to get, oh, sorry, do you look at any other RMOs, how they deal with distribution? Um, you, you know, as, as much as I can understand, and, and I have been looking into it a little bit, I'm trying to understand the tuna world a little bit more and how they work with their, they, they publish these, what are they called, Dave, the resolutions or something? Yeah. Um, and for example, it's in the news, the recent, Tuna RFMO that 
just uh, used MSE to come up with a management procedure for some species, but the distribution wasn't in there at all. I think um, a lot of RFMOs and processes I'm familiar with, allocation is sort of a separate outside of the MSE. It's a, deci it's a decided upon distribution or whatever it is, but the Hague Treaty, for example, has clear definitions of allocation. Um, and so, yeah, it's something that I'm trying to learn more about. I think you can look beyond our models as well. Um, so, in the, for example, the uh, regional management councils often have distribution to states area. Yeah. And was, uh, right now, there's a, that box has been opened up. And oh, has it? Uh, oh. They're considering a, a wide range of new, new things because of the shifting stock issue. Yeah. So you've got allocations based on historical landings that no longer match where the fish are being caught. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'll look into that. Do you want to just leave that last slide up and we'll have lunch and come back in an hour? This one there? Yeah. Sure. sure. Just... Okay. For those okay. online, we'll be back in one hour. Thank you. Okay, so we are on agenda item 4.1.3. We have an afternoon. Hopefully, it will keep us entertained. Oh, yeah. That, oh, yeah, we can move back to mine for a minute if you want. Oh, yeah. sure. We do have that yeah. presentation. Okay. Um, so sorry, sorry to change. If we could just have that PowerPoint presentation that I sent to you publishing just before lunch. It's the work meeting paper 10 PowerPoint. Thank you. So to, to preface, this is um, this was intended to be an informal prospectus for the commissioners on where we stood with regard to the items in the five-year research plan and what had been accomplished, what we saw, and, and in particular trying to highlight for them, because one of the questions you'll recall from our June meeting from the science advisors was trying to give the commissioners a heads up on which things were likely to rock the boat and which weren't. So that this was my attempt at that um, based on topics from the, the five-year research plan. So I guess we can we can step through them. I've already touched on several of them. And again, this is not intended to be technical. This was just a broad level view of, of my take on them. The fishery sex ratio at age, we've already talked about that uh, and including the recommendation to continue it, at least in the short term. Um, whale depredation, again, touched on that. We see it being particularly important for the fishery efficiency, but not critically sensitive to the assessment. We also talked about coordination with the MSE, and I think that we've, as we've evolved to this three-year cycle, I think we're all pretty happy with the, the phase step that we're in, finally, after a couple of years of being out of phase. Um, then now we get into some of the more technical stuff from the stock assessment portion of the five-year research plan. Um, you recall from the 2022 full assessment that we did some extensive work on data weighting, um, specifically bootstrapping the sampling programs to come up with solid starting points for data weighting. So that was a that was something that was in the 2021, is it 21 to 6 or 21 to 5 research plan? I forget. 22 to 26. 22 to 26, sorry. So that was in the 22 to 26 plan and we hit it right away with the 22 stock assessment. So we've we've made some major progress on there. That piece in particular didn't have a, a large effect on the stock assessment. You'll also recall that we did an extensive analysis on different ways to treat the PDO and evaluating whether we could get uh, some improved performance of environmental covariates to recruitment and 
were ultimately unsuccessful in doing any better than the current approach, which is just a binary positive negative phase of the PDO. <clears throat> Leading parameter estimation, we did make a large change there. Uh, that was the estimation of natural mortality in an additional model out of the four model ensemble. We had previously been estimating it in two. Now we're estimating it in three. This is one where we're going to continue to evaluate the model that retains the fixed natural mortality assumption um, and try to better understand under what conditions we could or couldn't reliably estimate M in that model as well. Um, so I think that's something that certainly uh, I'm looking forward to working more on over the next year. I guess what's not in this list that we've already talked about this morning is the potential to use the assessment as a simulation tool for statistical science as well. So that's postdating this. On that topic, I guess I, I did have one comment from this morning, which is just that my experience with survey simulations has been that we generally you simulate things that meet your expectations. And when they do that, then the models often perform quite well, even under not much data. But the really nasty spots are when things don't do what you expected. And we, I think Alan and I have worked through at least three of those types of events in our careers. But the Hake, we had a year when the when squid showed up on the West Coast. We've seen a couple of examples in Alaska just recently of <laughs> during COVID, everybody thought missing a survey wouldn't be a big deal. And snow crab, the snow crab mm -hmm. stock crashed that year. And it took an extra year to figure it out. And similarly, in the Gulf of Alaska, in uh, 2016, the Pacific cod stock crashed due to the warm blob. But they do alternating surveys in the Gulf and the Aleutians, and so there wasn't a survey in the Gulf. So it took a whole extra year to figure out what was going on. Meanwhile, the quota was staying high, um, and so that one actually is one that might have been, might have seen that coming. Um, just because they knew the survey was alternating. But I guess my point with those three examples are that the really challenging parts often come from events that we don't Can't really predict. have any way to predict. <laughs> so any thoughts you guys have on how to either include some rare events and or appropriately describe results from simulation studies that necessarily won't include those kinds of events. Um, I think is important because, like you said, the biggest danger is that you do some simulations, even with some pretty big variability, and find out there's not a huge cost. And yet, you know, there is a cost. It's just that it takes one of those unexpected events to create it. Well, you can, you can impose them. You can Good. say, okay, in 3B, the stock drops by 30%. Yeah. And you can easily do that in your simulation. Just throw M up there to knock it down. And... Uh, see and then redo your and this is why you do the stock assessment yeah. what would happen to the stock assessment how long would it take for that thing to figure it out if you had done one two or three years between surveys and stuff like that. so you put in a very specific mm -hmm. event occurs and you see if you can capture or respond to that event yeah like you yeah, you could try like an m natural mortality event <clears throat> where it drops you could also do like an extreme low survey event compare the two one's right. just an observation error one's a process error and see how they would differ we have some evidence in the historical series within particular areas of pretty large jumps year to year and often when they happen everybody says oh maybe that was just sampling variability sometimes it was and sometimes the trend continues on yeah. from the new level and it appears to have been a real change another one Either would up be or down. a trending m because so yep. we see in herring, like if we would have seen some trends, same thing with ground fish on the East Coast, depending on the strength of the trend in M, how, how long it would take your assessment to figure that stuff out, because you actually don't estimate time bearing M, so it's going to be a while. Yeah, that would get worse until it really looked bad, and we did something about it. So anyway, I think that's worth <clears throat> worth considering as we talk about doing some simulation work. I'm mean, not at all opposed to doing some simulation work. I just think that that's making, what I've making been sure the in. right conditioners are on. The yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think that's a good motivator to do some simulation work on the assessment mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. The other, so I, I like the idea of doing these discrete scenarios. What, what if this would happen? The other way to go there would be to uh, take the historical time series and just uh, fit some fat tail distributions to it. So you, you do get a plausible frequency of extreme events. You know, so you're fitting those distributions to the existing time series. 
um, simulating out with, with, with distributions that include a higher chance of really. I would put this, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a trade off between, you know, how, how big an event and how unlikely that, right. that event is. And, and this sort of allows you to weight how unlikely those big events are as well. Sure. It's always challenging because you know, these are rare events by definition. You don't know that one's going to happen anytime soon. But they do happen in fisheries, even in the North Pacific. I think probably, to, to my mind, a, a, a localized mortality event and or an anomaly in migration such that fish move right out of an area and don't come back for a couple of years that goes undetected. Uh, those would be things that are fairly plausible and not that difficult to simulate. So something to think about. Uh, the, so the rest of them here, um, as I mentioned, maturity, skip spawning, and fecundity is reproductive potential. We see this as having the largest potential impact on assessment results just because it's affecting not only the current status, but also the reference it's both sides of the equation. Um, however, as you, you'll see from Dr. Webster's talk, if we don't do, if we do a very limited survey in 2024, this might really slow us down on collecting enough mature, uh, fecundity samples to get a, a coastwide fecundity. I think right now we have solid sampling in regions two and three, but we're, we're really lacking in region four. And so if we don't do anything there in next year for the survey, it's going to be a challenge. We talked in June about stock structure for IPHC regulatory area 4B. And you know, to reiterate that discussion, that's particularly important for the management of 4B. 4B only represents three to five percent of the coastwide stock. So if we're way off in 4B, it's not going to change our perception of the overall stock, but we might really be over under harvesting in 4B specifically. So to the degree that we learn more about what's going on in 4B, that's important particularly for that area. The broader look at metapopulation dynamics, I think that this feeds more into the longer term research. And this is where we start to get this back and forth between um, the MSE operating models and the assessment. So you'll recall that we started creating a spatially explicit model on the assessment side of things. We did a lot of work fitting the data and, and and development and then we've since moved that into the operating model um, for the MSC and at some point I could imagine we get that refined to the point where we're even willing to consider moving it back to the tactical side um, but this is I, I, I don't see this as being something that's going to happen overnight I, there are not that many highly complex spatial stock assessment models that are being used for tactical advice anywhere. for good reason for good reason exactly um, the next one, and, and these are the, the topics are right out of the five-year plan, biological interactions with fishing gear and discard mortality rates. I, I describe this as relatively small but incremental improvements. So this is something that's not likely to change the assessment on a large scale in a particular year, but it's something that if we chip away at this, we improve the precision of our estimates of discard rates, discard mortality rates, uh, whale depredation. All of these things are going to slowly refine and improve our data sets and or improve the performance of the fishery. So these are things that we, that the fishery wins and the assessment wins, but only in a slow and incremental fashion. These are, these are small changes. And so far, our investigations on these, for example, on the recreational and the commercial side have indicated that the, the rates, for example, discard mortality rates are not terribly different than the rates we've been using. So it's good to have to firm those up. But because we're getting results that are fairly consistent, we're not seeing a big change in our overall estimates of mortality. The last one's not in our prioritized list, but it's something that I think we all have on our horizon scan, which is close can mark recapture. And I've de described this to the commissioners as this is a long term effort. We're collecting fin clips on tens of thousands of fish every year. Those are providing potentially a baseline for this someday. But I think we're probably a long way away from being able to move forward doing it. But we are trying to set ourselves up so that when and if we have an intersection between money and opportunity, we're ready to go on this and investigate it. I don't think the commission has a few million dollars to spend on this right now, but it could be. 
could be that either the price comes down or the interest level goes up. So, <coughs> so anyways. It's not something that is like in the NPRB or funders to the sound that's specific or? Well, I think the bottleneck yeah. is, is is first to have a pretty clear idea what sample sizes and what your classes we need to cover. Uh, and uh, before we embark in, in a submission to do CKMR for the purpose of, of, of what it's for, uh, population size, fecundity, natural mortality. And I think uh, we had, and I think we uh, mentioned that to the SRB before we had some contacts with CSIRO regarding that. We had a couple of calls uh, where we discussed um, you know, potential avenues to go in that direction. And and I think what it's needed really is a pilot study uh, to determine sample sizes, to determine, you know, how many years of collection we still need to do in order to have the, the samples that, that are going to give us information about, you know, uh, parent offspring, sibling pairs, um, all those kind of relationships that you need to so yeah i think i think prior to that final proposal to do the ckmr study i think we need to do work previously outside of that kind of funding and depending on the number of samples that's what kind of that's what's going to determine the cost of the project because it's really the it's the sequencing costs that's going to be the limiting factor in our initial discussions with CSIRO, um, we they went through sort of the basic layout for a CKMR approach, and we said, "Yeah, but the halibut fishery is mostly female." And I said, "Okay, that's going to make more samples, and they live a pretty long time. That's going to take more samples, and we don't have a lot of real juvenile. We have a lot of intermediate age fish, and that's going to take more samples." We sort of went down the list, and it's like, "This is going to not only does this violate all the basic." But it's going to, you know, all, all of these things are contributing to this being larger than the sort of standard approach. So, uh, as Joseph said, we sort of all concluded that we needed to do a formal pilot to really scope out the sample size and power before embarking on something broader. Pilot being continue to collect your genetic samples and then just to work on, on the existing database that you have, or, or go out and actually in a pilot? collections no I, I think the way at least the way i understood it was that you would set up a simulation model and evaluate what what for the specific conditions that you have how, what sampling would you need so it's a little bit backwards because in most cases you haven't done any sampling and you're trying to figure out what to collect in our case we've already collected hundred thousand or more fin clips we're just trying to figure out what we would need to add to that collection and how much it cost to run it but it, but in order to do that you kind of have to write out all the equations and set up the analysis to see what that would take as, as mark bravington described it you've you've pretty much done it without data at that point and then you just add the data as you if and when you can afford it i mean but, you can do that very easily it, with simulations um you, you create um, simulated adults, you simulate a breeding struct, you know, a, a breeding system with some expectation of number of mates, number of offspring, you subsample, um, you, uh, I mean, so there, there's a series of, you know, fairly well-established steps. And then you, you estimate what the accuracy of the, um, of the pedigree, uh, the pedigree relationship is and you know what what is what is the error and the error is uh, associated with the number of individuals um and the and uh what you expect to need to sample um and the error is associated with the number of markers that you have and or, or markers that you need and you have to determine that but that's relatively easy to do um you could I mean, you have allele frequencies, you can simulate genotypes, et cetera, and you could see in simulations, you know, with say 100, 500, 1,000 
5,000 markers uh, what you need to do. And one of the media, intermediate steps that you're going to have to do um, is uh, develop um, a rapid screening approach using either like RAD capture or um, uh, GTC. You can't do low sequence, next, low, uh, low coverage sequencing for the sample sizes uh, that you're going to need to do. It's just not feasible. So that has to be a step where you, you have how many loci and using what rapid screening approach uh, can we actually do. But I mean, the, the, the steps in terms of the simulations, you know, with a reasonable expectations of the species reproductive ecology, uh, the number of markers that you need given some distribution of allele frequencies um, and, um, you know, sampling um, in the number of individuals and the number of, you know, the number of pairs, the number of parents, et cetera. I mean, these are things that are, are relatively easy to do. Yeah, I think where we started to hit some impediments is when, as we explained some of the specific biology of halibut, and I think it's at one point Mark Gravington said, yeah, it's probably going to take about six months of my time to adjust all of the standard simulations to match halibut biology. And then we started talking about the relatively open status of the population, perhaps crossover with Russia, non-random sampling of both juveniles and adults, and we started to wonder whether uh, how, whether and how this was going to work out. Well, so I mean, this we could probably sit, uh, help you a little bit there. We've done this quite a bit. We have some scripts, including on my lab's GitHub site, um, that does these simulations. So uh, when you're at a point where you'd like to do that, I'd be happy to share that information. So that's it. Th those two slides were the all all the bullets from the five-year research plan. Thank you. That's very helpful. Okay, I think now we can switch to our biological. Interesting. Don't forget to have the PowerPoint up for paper 08, please. Are you able to navigate from there? Yep. yep. Chill. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, I'm going to provide a report on the current and future biological and system science research activities. Um, just as a as an overview, and mostly for for Anna's uh, benefit as a new member, um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to go over uh, very briefly um, about the really the scope of the activities uh, that are in the biological and next system research uh, branch um, so our activities as you can see here in this black uh, in this red box are really intended to provide key uh, inputs into stock assessment and management strategy evaluation but also to provide basic and applied understanding of some of the biological process that uh, we're investigating and we receive input from the two IPHC uh, subsidiary bodies, uh, this one, the SRB, and then the Research Advisory Board that meets, that meets once a year. Uh, and based on the recommendations, we, we tailor our research activities um, uh, to uh, further improve the needs of, of, of the two uh, downstream processes. Um, the research activities that are conducted um, um, uh, related to biological and system research are now um, um, described in the five-year program of integrated research and monitoring. And this really stems from a previous five-year um, uh, plan of, of uh, biological research uh, that I will be referring to just to provide a little bit of, of background information on, as to where we are. But uh, in summary, the five main research areas that we're contemplating within this five-year uh, program, the current one, are um, this 
um, five indicated here, migration and population dynamics, uh, reproduction, growth, uh, mortality and survival assessment, and then fishing technology. And I'll be providing just the, the, the overview on each of these, and then I'll let uh, the various uh, research biologists who speak to their respective areas. Uh, so uh, you'll be hearing from uh, Claude Dijkstra, Andy, Jason Awich, and Colin Jones about their respective work. Um, so this is a, a, a table that is, is very hard to see, but this is just an example of what we've been trying to do over the last few years, and that is really to provide justification for all our research activities in each of these uh, different research areas. And this is one of the appendix that you see in, in paper number eight that was provided, and it's also included in the five-year research plan. This is just, without going into detail, I'll, I'll, I'll blow this part of this uh, uh, table uh, in the next slide. This just uh, is uh, an indication of the five-year uh, the five research areas uh, in each in different colors, the specific research activities, the research outcomes, and the relevance for stock assessment, management evaluation, management strategy evaluation, and then at the end, our research prioritization based on what you've just heard from, from uh, Ian. Um, this is really a, a, a more readable portion of that um, table in which, uh, you know, the first two uh, research areas in terms of priority are highlighted. Uh, so you see uh, in, in this purple, uh, the research area on migration and population dynamics. Um, uh, here uh, you see three different research activities. One is population structure going from top to bottom, distribution, larval and juvenile connectivity studies. And then uh, going towards the right, the outcomes of each of these research activities, the expected outcomes, um, what are their relevance for stock assessment, what are the relevance for uh, MSE, what are the specific analysis inputs going into stock assessment and, and MSE, their ranks within stock assessment and MSC, and then the overall rank that is, is really what determines the, the prioritization that, that we are applying. So in terms of research prioritization, the work that we're undertaking right now on migration population dynamics is, is number two. If you go to the bottom one, uh, the research area and reproduction, the one in green, we have the different, you know, research activities that the, that will be described here, um, histological maturity assessment, fecundity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the expected research outcomes, again, the relevance for both stock assessment and MSC, and then the final um, a prioritization, and this is, as Ian just indicated, um, security and fecundity is, is uh, the, the, the top priority of all the research activities. So that's why it was ranked as number one. The, the, next, uh, um, the next series of, of slides, and there's only two, uh, are how, uh, how we could provide a little more detail into uh, why are these um, research areas are, are prioritary for, for both stock assessment and MSC? And here you see the prioritization list from the point of view of stock assessment. And on the, on the left-hand side column, you see what are the categories that are ranked uh, from biological input to assessment data collection to fishery yield. And, and how are they ranked according to the research area? Again, in, in different colors. Uh, so here you, it's a table that is also an appendix to uh, this document, an appendix to the five-year um, program of uh, integrated research and monitoring, where you can see a little further justification of uh, the, the ranking of the different research activities. And the same can be seen for the MSC uh, as in as shown in the next slide. So the MSC rank is based on uh, biological parameterization and validation of movement estimates. Most of the work related to uh, migration population dynamics. The second would be biological parameterization and validation of recruitment variability and distribution. There's some research activities related to migration and population dynamics, but then there's some others that are related to reproduction. And then the third one is the biological parameterization and validation for growth projections. And that's mostly related to the uh, work that's being conducted on growth. And then finally, fishery parameterization, 
which is really the work that we're doing on, on mortality assessment and discard mortality estimations. So that's just an example of how you know we've been over the last probably five years. We've actually been working quite hard in in providing a, a, a proper justification for all the research activities so that they're really well aligned with the needs of both stock assessment and, and MSC. Um, uh, the, the, the next slide is just an example of how specific research outputs fit into stock assessment and MSC. And uh, um, if you take, for example, uh, some of the research activities related to migration population dynamics, uh, we have work on larval and juvenile movement. We have work on stock structure and population assignments, adult distribution. This this is work that is current and planned. Uh, and, and you'll see here on the left how it fits into stock assessment by reducing uncertainty in spatial dynamics, by uh, providing information on changes in assessment structure. And then if you look to the right is how that fits in with uh, with management strategy evaluation, parametrization of movement and recruitment distribution in the operating model. And we can do this uh, uh, for the, some of the other research areas. Another example will be uh, two uh, research outputs uh, stemming from the research area of reproduction. One is the information on sex ratios from the commercial landings. The other one is information on maturity and fecundity. And and on the left is how it, that would, information would fit into stock assessment and on the right is how that information would fit into uh, management strategy evaluation. And lastly, the work on um, mortality and survival assessment and fishing technology, the different research outputs also link uh, into both processes. So that's 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 really how uh, we see um, uh, all those research activities uh, being justified in, in, their, in, in terms of their ability to provide useful and important inputs into the two processes, stock assessment and MSC. So next what I'll do is I'll, uh, for each of the five research areas, I'll just provide a, a brief introduction for each one and then I'll let um, uh, the other staff members to uh, speak to them. So um, this uh, summary slides uh, are, are, are very similar in, term, in, in terms of providing um, information that was derived from the previous five-year uh, research plan from 2017 to 2021 and how that information that was generated in that first five-year plan uh, informs and directs the research activities that are now being uh, contemplated and planned within the within the current um, program of integrated research and monitoring 2022-2026. So re regarding migration population dynamics, we did uh, quite a bit of work regarding larval connectivity and juvenile connectivity initially. Um, um, that work uh, uh, was reflected in, uh, in a paper that was published by Laurie Sadoros et al. in 2021. And, and in this slide, in your, in your PDF, uh, as well as in the document, you have links, direct links to that publication. And, and basically the, the, that publication what provided was information on uh, larval trajectories from five different spawning, uh, known spawning locations, both in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea, uh, and how larval trajectories uh, could be modeled um, uh, in order to start understanding the connectivity between spawning areas and, and potential north spray areas. And that work um, really was informative, uh, not only uh, the larval stage, but also at the juvenile stage, because it's also showed um, um, using also uh, race, um, uh, um, space and time model that uh, juveniles actually move back from the Bering Sea into the Gulf of Alaska. Perhaps one of the most interesting um, in pieces of information that derived from the larval connectivity work is that there was uh, an estimation of the percent of potential larva that would be transported from the Bering Sea uh, to the Gulf of Alaska or from the Gulf of Alaska to the Bering Sea. So that interbasin level connectivity. Um, so uh, based from that work, um, uh, we've proposed uh, several different research activities within the current uh, research plan. The, uh, the one that we're currently uh, contemplating is the mapping 
of settlement and nursery areas in order to establish potentially that link between spawning areas and, 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 and juvenile uh, settlement areas. And for that purpose, uh, we initiated a project in which we started to collect uh, information on presence, absence of juvenile halibut. And the main purpose of this work was to map juvenile halibut, ju uh, juvenile Pacific halibut habitat, uh, nursery habitat specifically. So we started to collect information from um, from uh, different uh, data sources, and and so far we have um, uh, a large a collection of, of of data points uh, indicating presence absence of juvenile Pacific halibut um, uh, throughout its range. And um, we've started to map uh, the presence uh, of uh, Pacific halibut uh, coastwide. Uh, and also with uh, starting to link that presence absence um, um, map with um, um, habitat information uh, regarding, to, uh, specifically regarding to depth regarding to type of substrate uh, in order to better get a, a better picture of uh, juvenile habitat okay so this is this is still work in progress and and um, uh, hopefully we will be, we're going to be able to continue in, in this effort uh, another uh, important piece of information that was derived from the first five-year research plan was uh, our initiating uh, studies related to uh, uh, Pacific halibut population genomics. And for that, one of the first activities was to sequence the Pacific halibut genome in order to have a solid tool with which to work uh, and continue our, our genomics work. Uh, you're going to hear about this from Andy in just, uh, in just a minute. And uh, the work that we're actually conducting right now, and I'll pass uh, uh, the word to Andy, is uh, work on uh, population structure. So Andy, um, you can take it away. I'll, I'll, yeah, you can hurt. Actually, let me pass the slides because just let me know when you want to. Okay, go ahead. So, um, so yeah, so I have a few slides. Is that somebody online there? Or? Well, so, this is, you know, I was just going to ask, Josep, um, so the, the study of, of juvenile uh, uh, habitat, uh, where it is, uh, the relative number of individuals in different areas is interesting, but what is the objective? I mean, what do you hope to use this data to do? Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Kim. Uh, yes, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the ultimate purpose of this work is to map uh, Pacific Halibut juvenile habitat and then to, as we as we did in the first uh, in the in the previous five year research plan where we where we we, we mapped uh, larval trajectories stemming from uh, five known spawning grounds the idea would be now to identify where those potential nursery areas would be and establish again uh, uh, try to embark in studies in which we can look at the connectivity of larval and juvenile stages from known spawning grounds to known or expected nursery areas um, because we don't have those identified. So there's there's currently no no mapped juvenile nursery habitat available, uh, and that's precisely what we're trying to do. Uh, so bottom line is is to try to link spawning areas with nursery grounds. So how do you do that? I mean, you have, I mean, do, do you have genetics on these juveniles so you could match them to adults from different spawning locations? I don't understand how you can infer that juveniles caught in some spawning habitat in some place came from a specific area. Yeah, we do have, um, we do have samples from juvenile Pacific halibut that were collected uh, in the Eastern Bering Sea. We have a large collection of samples that uh, we haven't got to yet. Uh, we're hoping to uh, complete the work that Andy is currently conducting before we embark on that study. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so I have a few slides here um, to serve as an update on the progress that's been made uh, in the research area of population genomics. <clears throat> 
And I have a couple uh, slides of, or you know, background slides just to reorient everybody to, uh, you know, the study design and the genomics work that's been done uh, at IPHC um, so far. Um, so the population genomics work is really aimed at um, resolving the genetic structure of Pacific halibut stock in IPHC convention waters. And so um, to do that, we have um, samples collected from five different geographic areas shown in the map here um, between the years of 1999 and 2020. Um, and these samples were collected during the winter time when fish are um, on the spawning grounds. So um, to generate the, the data for this project, um, we're utilizing low coverage whole genome resequencing um, and this method allows for um, interrogation of genomic variation at, at very high uh, resolution. Um, essentially, this with this method, um, we have the capability of sampling every base pair in an individual's genome. And really, again, yeah, this is this is aimed at establishing a baseline of um, of genetic diversity for the the, the halibut stock residing in um, convention waters. And since this is a genomic approach, we can also um, analyze this data set in order to identify potential local and or environmental adaptations. Yeah, so, so in this blue box here, um, I just have kind of some, um, a few points on the data set that we've generated so far. So um, we have usable uh, sequence data from 570 individuals. Um, we initially targeted uh, uh, about 50 samples per um, collection. And we've done uh, three sequencing runs to date on the Illumina Nova Seq S4. And we're observing an average um, per sample genomic coverage of, of about 3.5x. 3, 3 um, and you can think of this metric as essentially sequencing an individual's genome three and a half times over. Um, initial uh, processing of this data set has led us to identify about um, 10.2 million SNPs in autosomal regions of the genome, and about 4.7 million of those SNPs have a minor allele frequency um, greater than 5%. Um, and this is a filtering threshold that we're using for some of the analyses that we, that we have planned. So, so before, I guess, going into um, details on the work that's been done since um, since June, um, I want to make a mention of the Pacific halibut reference genome um, because significant effort was put into this and it's really the result of, of a, a su successful collaboration between IPHC and a number of other research institutions um, where not only did we generate a um, annotated genome sequence, but we also characterized the sex determining region of the genome uh, of Pacific halibut. And they're, an interesting species to work on because um, Pacific halibut use a ZZZW sex determining system where females are the heterogametic sex, um, but their closest relative, the Atlantic halibut, actually uses an XXXY where males are the heterogametic sex. So from an evolutionary standpoint, they're, they're, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, system. Um, but in any case, um, the genome was published in 2002 or, or 2022. Um, and that's publicly, also it's publicly available. Um, it's about 602 million base pairs in length and contains uh, 24 uh, chromosomes. It's fully annotated, meaning that we know the location and um, the um, identity of about 28,000 genes. Um, and having this resource available is, is really critical for like interpreting the results that we're generating from the population genomic study because um, it may help us provide some genetic basis for various life history traits, um, not only with this this research but you know future research as well. Um, and I guess yeah, since it came up um, about um, you know excluding SNPs that aren't in um, non-autosomal SNPs. Um, so through this through this work, we identified a large um, 12 million base pair sex associated region on chromosome nine, and this is really the basis for um, that we're using to exclude SNPs from the current um, projects because including sex associated markers um, has a tendency to bias um, various analyses of population structure. So, yes. okay, so back to um, the the population genomics work. Um, so on this slide, I have um, 
the bioinformatic workflow that we proposed um, for the analysis of the, the low coverage whole genome resequencing data. Um, and this is not really meant to go on a, a, a ton of detail, but just provide um, serve as you know a roadmap that tracks the flow of data through the various stages of the project. Um, and so in each box is a, is a brief description of the step. And then below it in the blue is um, the software that we're using to uh, carry out that step. So, um, or, yeah. so, so we made a couple modifications since June um, in response to um, two, recommend, two recommendations from the SRB. So the first was the um, addition of um, estimating additional um, summary measures of genetic diversity, and that's in one of the red boxes um, on the slide here. And then also in um, response to recommendation 20, uh, we've also added um, population assignment testing as well, and that's in, in the other red box. So, so in response to that first recommendation, um, uh, recommendation 11, um, where additional um, summary measures of genetic diversity were requested, um, we produced this table here um, with the requested measures uh, for each sample collection, and then um, all sample collections pooled within a geographic area. Um, and, and so the, the, the measures that we're summarizing here are um, number of SNPs with a minor allele frequency of at least 1%, number of SNPs with a minor allele frequency of at least 5%, um, FIS, which essentially measures um, how observed levels of heterozygosity depart from expected levels of heterozygosity given um, the allele frequency at a site. And so the numbers for um, FIS, observed and expected heterozygosity, are averages, um, are genome-wide averages for all the SNPs uh, that we have in our data set. So. Hey, Andy, could I ask a question for on this? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I was curious how FIS was estimated. Usually, and, and I know that these are averages over many, many loci, it's expected minus observed over expected heterozygosity. And right. if you look at that, um, that really doesn't seem to uh, be the case. So, I mean, that's one question. And the second question is, is why do you think that each individual year's sample, the FIS value is is uh, significantly higher than the average overall years. Um, yeah, I guess so. That's a good question. I did, you know, thinking about that. I mean, so I guess positive FIS values right indicate, um, a, you know, a, a deficit of heterozygotes, right? Um, so that could be due to right, like non-random mating in the sample. Um, it's kind of the, the signature there, but I think it could. So this is summarized, I guess. So I think there might be some like really low frequency SNPs that are like contributing to that um, because these, this, this was taken. So this is based. So all the SNPs that went into this were based, are filtered at like a minor allele frequency of 1% like globally, right? So um when you start breaking that down into each sample collection, you know, the, the actual allele frequency might be a lot smaller. And so maybe you can't get as accurate, like accurate estimates of, um, of allele frequencies at that level or like the um, estimate heterozygosity levels as well. So, um, so maybe, yeah, like a, a high, you know, if we filtered say like each sample collection at say, one percent or even five percent i mean that might um clean things up a bit but um yeah it could be an artifact of the relatively smaller sample size on a per year basis i mean there are yeah. alternative explanations which might be interesting and you could explore in some of your downstream analysis another reason is you could have admixture yeah so right. you have heterogeneous subgroups of individuals within each year's worth of collection and subsuming that variability over multiple years, you have a more representative allele frequency estimate over the mixture of, of, of individuals from different places. So, I mean, it's just things like that that might yeah. be in, interesting to explore once you get to your clustering and other ways of uh, looking at uh, what these individuals are like. Another what would be interesting would just be looking at heterogeneity and allele frequencies across years within groups. Sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, 
Thanks for that. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so, oh, sorry. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so from there, um, the next few slides I have kind of focus on um, analyses that are based off the um, principal, based off of principal components analysis, or they rely on principal components analysis to some degree. Um, and we priority, prioritized these um, analyses shown in red here, um, since they addressed um, components of of um, SRB recommendation 13, um, which pertain to um, SNP outlier detection and testing. Um, recommendation 14, which is establishing statistical significance of, of those outlier loci. And then also recommendation 20, um, which pertains to um, um, performing analyses of unsupervised clustering in order to get a feel for um, any structure that might be present in the data set. Okay, so um, so to start with, we um, initiated work to address um, uh, portions of component A of, of recommendation 20, which is shown on the screen here. Um, and specifically, we're performing k-means clustering analysis um, using the principal components scores uh, for the individual samples that we um, estimated in our uh, PCA analysis. So, so the PCA was based off of four, um, about 4.7 million autosomal SNPs with a minor allele frequency. That, that's, that, that's after applying a minor allele frequency threshold of 5%. Um, and so from there, um, in order to proceed with other downstream analyses, really the first step is make a determination on how many principal components you want to retain into those um, downstream analyses. And so to do that, we visually inspected the um, raw eigenvalues for the top 20 um, principal components. And then following Cattell's rule, we selected the top three um, because essentially Cattell's rule states that you, um, you know, identify an inflection point in those eigenvalues and anything before that, um, those are, you know, considered meaningful um, principal components that can be used for downstream analyses. Um, and that that's shown in the in that figure on the left here, the, the eigenvalues for the top 20 components. Um, so then the, going on to the figures on the right, um, these are related to the k-means clustering analysis that we performed um, in R. And so what we did here was we took those top three components and then tested a range of k-values. And k essentially um, it defines the number of clusters that 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 it's partitioning your data into, right? Um, so we tested k-values for one to twenty and compared um, the fit for each clustering solution using um, total within cluster sum of squares invasion information criterion. And for both of these, lower numbers are better. And in like an ideal situation, you would identify like a minimum minimum value and that might provide strong support for, you know, the true number of clusters in your data set, or even again, like an inflection point. Um, and based on, you know, just, you know, the, the eyeball method and, and the way that these values decay, um, it seems that k-means clustering can't really identify um, discrete clusters using the entire data set of 4.7 uh, million autosomal SNPs, um, suggesting that there's very little stock structure, um, you know, present in that, in, you know, in the, in the, in the entire um, genomic data set that we have. Now that might change when we start to identify, you know, when we start to um, identify a low site that might be highly discriminatory of um, geographic origin, but um, that's, you know, for, for later analyses. So then um, moving on from that um, to address components of uh, recommendation 13 and 14, um, which pertain to outlier testing and um, establishing statistical support for those outliers, we conducted a PCA-based selection scan. Um, and you can see, so, and so this figure is a um, visual representation of that. So each point um, represents a single SNP um, and they're ordered along the x-axis um, based on their genomic coordinates. And so along the bottom, you see alternating colors. So each chromosome, um, so the colors alternate by chromosome. Um, and then on the y-axis, these are um, negative log transformed value, p-values. So, um, you know, the higher the value, the, the stronger statistical support you have uh, for that SNP to be as an outlier. And the test statistic we used was the um, 
PC adapt test it, test statistic. Um, and this is and this again was calculated along those top three principal components that we identified in the previous slide. And this statistic is based off of uh, robust melanobus distance. Um, it follows a chi-squared distribution with uh, um, three degrees of freedom, which are, you know, that's related to the number of principal components you're calculating this from. And then to uh, correct for um, multiple testing, uh, we applied the benjamini hochberg procedure to control for a false discovery rate um, of 0 0.001. Um, in doing that, um, we identified approximately 16,000 um, SNPs that, that may be candidates um, for being under selection. Um, and those are highlighted in red um, here. And so, you know, I guess, yeah, the next step with this would be then again, you know, take that list of SNPs, you know, and interrogate it for um, possible, you know, functional significance using that genome annotation that we have. Next slide. And then, yeah, to close things out, um, just to, I guess, you know, um, reorient everybody to, um, you know, sort of where we are in the overall analysis. So this, again, is that um, workflow. So the boxes in green are steps that are completed. Um, the boxes highlighted in yellow are steps that are in progress. Um, and, and at the current moment, I'm really working on um, addressing the, you know, kind of remaining components of recommendations 13 and 14, and specifically specifically establishing statistical significance for the FST-based outlier scans. And then once that complete, that's completed, um, I plan to move on um, estimating um, individual admixture proportions to um, sort of close out the clustering analyses that we have planned. Um, Oops, sorry. Yeah, and that, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that does it for me. Questions or keep moving. Okay, the next uh, research area is, is that of reproduction. We've conducted quite a bit of work um, uh, within the for, for the previous five year research plan. So basically, we characterize the reproductive cycle uh, of Pacific of female Pacific halibut based on the first histological assessment. Uh, so uh, we uh, learned uh, quite a few important pieces of information, such as the nature of the uh, oocyte development process. Uh, so we determined that uh, the Pacific halibut females are group synchronous, that they're bat spawners, uh, that they reproduce based on an annual cycle, that the peak of spawning is, is January, February. Uh, and uh, importantly, that uh, Pacific halibut females have a type of fecundity that it's determinate. Uh, and this this definitely will guide us uh, the, on the um, steps that we're taking now uh, within the current uh, five-year research plan. Um, that uh, work is summarized in two of our publications. Uh, the, that one from 2020, Journal of Fish Biology, and then one last year in Frontiers of Marine Science. Um, so from here, I'll let Colin Jones speak to our current plans. Uh, yeah, so this <laughs> first slide is just kind of a quick background. Um, this was all, this is, slide's been presented, I believe, at multiple SRP meetings in the past. Um, it just shows um, our first uh, reproductive assessment project with histology, uh, characterizing the annual cycle for female Pacific halibut. Um, and this was targeted, once again, in the Port Lock region, uh, which is kind of in the center of the Pacific halibut stock. Um, as you can see here um, on the figure, you have the months on the x-axis and the proportion of developmental stage on the y-axis. And it shows um, the spawning um, season, which was um, primarily in January, February. And then as the female Pacific halibut uh, develops in the spring, summer, and fall towards um, through the vitellogenic stages um, to redevelop those sites again for spawning for the next uh, winter season. Um, and one of the biggest outcomes of this study was to see whether or not the timing of our FIS was a good time for to sample for histology for female Pacific halibut. Um, and as you can see, the primary sampling for the FIS is usually about the end of May to the beginning um, of September. And that is a good time of year to sample because 
mature females have progressed into the pathogenic um, stages at that at that time of year. Um, and then as you can see on the right hand side, um, showing what we are going to be classifying as immature and mature uh, females. Um, so anything that's progressed into BTG1 or later, we are classifying as mature and anything prior to that. So um, either cortical alveoli or even before that, which is primary growth and periobubliolar stages are immature females. Um, and so using that information. So the cortical alveoli showing up in November and December, is that <clears throat> just a, like, a, what's, what's the meaning of that? Is that fish that have had a growing season and now they're starting to just go to mature the next year or? Uh, that could be a couple of things. One could be that those are immature females that have never progressed into the vitellogenesis stage or so have never previously spawned. Um, it could be um, either stuck at that stage and, and maybe continuing on to, into the next year. Um, that's um, an investigation that we are looking to pursue now that we have larger sample numbers. Because once again, this was just based on 30 females per month. So it's, um, seeing whether or not uh, having discussions with other people that have done work on marine fish around the United States. Um, there has been indications that females on cold water species can potentially what they call get stuck in the CA stage where they have, they're immature and they're trying to progress into being a mature female. Um, and they've, in, they've shown, there's been indication that some species have shown that to take multiple years to progress past that stage. Uh, that's just something we don't specific uh, Yeah, so using this information, um, one of the, we decided in 2022 was to conduct our first uh, coast-wide sampling on the FIS for histology of female Pacific halibut. Um, and so the primary outcome of that was to revise the maturity estimates uh, per biological region using histology. Um, because as you'll know, previously um, for a long, time, a long time now on the FIS, we've done uh, visual or macro uh, maturity estimates of female Pacific halibut. So um, every, um, every female, every Pacific halibut that gets, uh, that's going to be sold or landed, you know, is visually estimated. So for, you know, male and female and what that staging is. Um, and so we're now using histology to back up those estimates basically. So, but the current um, maturity estimates that Dr. Stewart uses in assessment are solely based on macro visual estimates in the field. And we're now using histology. Um, and so- or Can you say something about how different those are currently? Uh, does, does the answer really matter? Uh, the answer could matter. Uh, we don't have an, we don't quite know yet what the, what the potential differences are there. Um, that's definitely one of the goals um, that's been previously stated um, in those uh, figures that uh, Dr. Planas has shown is is trying to potentially revise our macro maturity estimates based on histology. So we can do a comparison of micro versus macro and see what people are classifying it in the field visually and what I'm seeing actually under the microscope, being able to help improve our macro estimates in the field using histology. Um, so coastwide uh, sampling in 2022, um, and then as as we've indicated, the 2023 FIS was reduced to only bio biological regions two and three for this year. So we collected samples uh, in two and three. So this uh, figure uh, table on the left shows um, the number of samples that we've been able to collect over the last two years um, on the FIS. So in 2022, um, our I think our total target um, 
estimate for sample collection coastwide was about 1,600 samples. Um, there was a drop in um, you know the collections in 2022. Um, so we ended up getting over 400 for biological region two, um, about 350 for biological region three. Um, 180 in biological region four and about 50 in biological region four B to about just over 1,000 samples collected. Um, and then this year, our target was to get 400 again in biological region two, and we met that goal, met that target. And then in biological region three, we were actually targeting 1,000 samples, um, and we were able to obtain about 700. Yes, the numbers for 2023 are estimated because the our FIS team is currently still doing QAQC on the 2023 FIS data. Um, and so that that number can change by a few up or down. Um, so we are able to get about 1100 samples for the 2023 FIS. Um, so definitely for biological regions two and three, we have a tremendous sample set. Um, then obviously as you move west, uh, our samples are dwindling. That's based on the FIS design. Um, so I definitely, um, it's important to note that our FIS primary objective is, you know, to look at distribution of Pacific halibut, you know, across its range, um, but also a critical component of the FIS is also collecting biological samples to improve our research, to, you know, help improve the stock assessment in the MSC. And as you'll hear from Dr. Webster, probably tomorrow, there's, um, there's going to be a struggle to get samples out west moving forward. Um, so that's um, just something for the SRB to know. Uh, yeah. Um, and so uh, this, using these samples and the data, and once I've uh, you know scored all of the uh, samples in the lab, this uh, same slide was presented back in June of how we're going to generate our maturity ogives. Um, so I won't go into too much in detail of this. I just will note that, um, you know, the IPHC Secretariat is an active member of the Marvels Working Group, um, which was a group that was actually created by NOAA Fisheries. Um, so it's a, con a conglomerate of life history biologists around the United States, as well as Canada and some other uh, countries around the world. Um, and we've actually started to create uh, a repository on our GitHub page for how to collect, how to, how to um, create uh, maturity ogives and stuff like that. So definitely, if you're interested in that, definitely check out that website. Um, so then moving on to fecundity. So as you recall, this year we um, wanted to target uh, fecundity samples as well as maturity. Um, and so for fecundity, we just focused on biological region three. Um, one of the main reasons for this was it's the center of the stock, but also uh, we are limited on the number of uh, small motion compensated scales that we can put out at sea on our vessels. Currently, we only have two. Um, so we had two vessels that were particularly uh, targeting this uh, biological region for the 2023 FIS. Um, and so we put, they had two scales, so one to collect weights on the adult halibut, but then also um, small to do whole ovary weights for fecundity samples. Um, we were able to get 457 um, fecundity samples. Uh, but then if you look at the, um, the data set, you'll see that of those 457, 299 of those were classified as either a two, three, or four, which is what we would consider to be a mature um, female Pacific halibut. Um, and then of those 299, we were able to get uh, 255 whole ovary weights at sea. Um, and so our target, as I'll pinpoint here in just a little bit, our target was about 250 to 300 samples. Um, and so we've we've hit that range, and so we're pretty satisfied with that. Um, and so using this, uh, using these samples, just to kind of reiterate the process that we're going to be using to um, calculate fecundity for Pacific halibut, and that's using the autodiametric method. Um, and what this entails is taking a subsample, basically taking a subsample of your sample um, and getting a mean oocyte diameter and using the number of oocytes per gram of tissue 
with the mean oocyte diameter, which will allow you to build what they call the autodiametric curve, which is shown here on the right. Um, and then once that curve is built, you'll be able to use the whole go over, uh, <laughs> the whole ovary weight, which was collected at C, and then the you know the the oocyte density basically to calculate your potential antifecundity per individual basis. And then if you click again, yeah, and so oh, just one more. Just back? Yeah, go back. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so you'll see here, um, this was a paper that was um, published by, I think, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center on yellowtail flounder. Um, and what those each individual line shows is different, I think, different regions um, in the New England water area. So, like, Georgia's Bank is one of those lines and other regions. Um, and we're hoping to kind of mimic this based on our four biological regions over time and being able to calculate potential handle fecundity for Pacific halibut based on our biological regions. Um, and then I'll lastly, I'll just show, so one of the main reasons why we wanted to pursue the autodiametric method is because we are definitely limited to uh, basically me as of right now, as far as processing samples. Um, and so once your curve is built, you're, be, you're able to process what we call unweight samples. And all you can do, basically what you can do is just calculate a mean oocyte diameter from that sample and then be able to use your curve to fit it and calculate potential antifoot kind of be rather than going through the whole process of getting mean oocyte diameter as well as using the weighted sample to get per gram number of oocytes per gram of tissue so once your curve is built you'll be able to process samples much faster um, so that's kind of the end goal and that's, I think that's what it is. Yeah. So is there, um, go ahead. I'm sorry, this is Kim. Um, is there any evidence that um, oocyte diameter varies as a function of female body size or age? Uh, right. That's, I mean, I would say as far as all the same. Um, Preliminary data suggests that there is actually no effect of body size on oocyte diameter, at least from the samples that uh, we have information for from the from the previous project. Um, so we're talking about uh, samples that were generated from a total of 380 females. Uh, so uh, we did not see any relationship with um, with um, increasing age as uh, and in, in that changing the oocyte diameter that's interesting yeah so the auto diametric method would certainly uh not work very well if uh you had to have different age classes or size classes of fish which had different different egg sizes Yeah, so I'll just um, maybe just in conclusion, kind of a, a little bit of a timeline. So right now we're finalizing the 2022 data set. Um, so all of um, and then um, probably are hoping to have histology slides made of the 2023 samples, maybe by the end of fall, hopefully by January. Uh, to start processing those. And then we're also um, currently uh, getting the, the proper you know, equipment in the lab to process the fecundity samples. And all of the samples are still coming back from the field on this, they all have made it back to the field. So I'll be spending a lot of time under the microscope over the next year processing a lot of this stuff. But it's exciting work. Uh, so just, uh, yeah, just, figuring out if we have reduced fist designs, um, how can we get samples out west is really the, uh, I would say, the biggest concern. Yeah, I agree. That's really interesting information. One question that I had is that the, the figure that you had of the proportions of fish in different stages uh, during each month of collection, does that um, vary across the different reporting groups? 
spatially? So are, are you saying that, uh, are you inferencing that there, that there could potentially be, like the annual reproductive cycle could be different among biological regions? Sorry, the mic was off. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I mean, it would be interesting to take a look at. I mean, I was just curious if you had and if there was any variation in terms of the staging chronology uh, across months in the different reporting regions. Well, unfortunately, all all the samples that um, that Colin is working with are collected pretty much around the same time, which is uh, you know, during the Fisher's Independent Satellite Survey. So th these are samples that are collected mostly in July and August. Um, so outside of that period of time, we, we don't really have any, any other samples uh, available for this study. Sure, but I mean, do they vary across regions for those months where the FIS was conducted? Well, this is this is something that we will yeah. we will learn um, uh, in a few months when when the staging is finalized. Yeah, both from the more extensive 2022 sampling and then from the more limited uh, 2023 sampling for maturity. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's another thing that we'll, we will be able to potentially um, investigate and calculate with the histology samples um, because I can directly look at potential rates of atresia, um, the breaking down of oocytes, uh, which some females might show depending on a whole bunch of different factors. And so that's that's something that's definitely observed during the scoring process of the samples is what what levels of atresia are shown and what we might be able to indicate as a potential skip So the, the analysis then will come up with uh, maturity ogives specific to each region as well as skip spawning rates specific to each region. Is that the goal? That that's that's a that that is a possible that is a that could be an end goal, yeah. So you basically, it's two types of what we call biological maturity, which would basically just be like take all of your histology samples, score them, create an ogive. That's what we would call bio biological maturity. Then there's what you would call functional maturity, which is where you incorporate skip spawning rates and those types of things. And it really, I think, ultimately comes down to what we end up seeing as a potential rate of skip spawning because it could end up being very minimal and it really does affect overall affecting the overall O drive. Uh, but that definitely is an end goal that we're looking towards is creating a, a functional maturity curve, which I know Dr. Stewart's very interested in for the assessment. <laughs> so we'll, we'll move on. Uh, yeah, the next research area is that of mortality and survival assessment, and, and uh, most of you have heard quite a bit of what we've done here the last five years, but uh, for Anna's benefit, um, uh, I'll just summarize that um, beginning in 2017, we embarked on, on two consecutive projects um, uh, with the goal to uh, estimate experimentally the discard mortality rates of fish that are discarded in two different types of fisheries, the long line directed uh, Pacific halibut fishery, and then the charter recreational fishery. So the first one, the discard mortality rate estimations in the long line fishery, the, the actual estimation of the, of the DMR has already been done, has been has been presented here. Um, what uh, Claude uh, Dijkstra, Dijkstra is going to be presenting is more on the characterization of fish that are in excellent uh, viability. So the, the full characterization of of the events lead, leading to classifying a fish as in, in excellent viability, 
uh, or other categories. Um, secondly, we've done a very similar study on the recreational uh, fishery in which we've already um, uh, established what the DMR is for this fishery uh, experimentally with the use of satellite tags. Uh, and we're in the process of characterizing um, the, the different viability categories in relation to um, fishing and capture conditions. Uh, and we will not be reporting on that here. So um, some of these results uh, have been published already. So we have two papers out uh, um, that uh, were published in 2021 and 2023. And now we have submitted a manuscript uh, which uh, encompasses some of the uh, data that uh, Claude's going to show right now. So go ahead, Claude. Sure. And these slides, again, these first couple slides are, um, they were presented back in June, but for Anna's benefit, we thought it'd be good to, to put them up again. So she's familiar with some of the recent work on it. But um, this slide kind of looks at the schematic of things that we looked at. So um, the, the treatment that the fish received was different hook releases. That's the second uh, panel there. So careful shake and ganyan cut are two methods that are in our regulations as allowed methods to release fish that won't be kept. And then the hook stripper um, is colloquially known as the crucifier is a method that's used to mechanically remove the fish from the gear. It's not allowed in the regulations, but occasionally it happens um, when there's rough seas or within other fisheries and things like that. So we wanted to see the effects of that as well. And for each of those, we collected on every fish, we collected injury information, um, we collected a variety of traits and conditions. So those were body traits, uh, length, weight, um, fat content. We took blood samples from the fish. Uh, we determined their sex. And then we also had environmental factors such as temperature, both the air temperature they were exposed to, the water temperature that they came from, um, how long the gear was soaked for, uh, what were the conditions during the haulback event, which can potentially affect the the tearing and the damage to the fish on the way to the surface, how long they were on deck, so that we weren't necessarily introducing our own um, effects, because normally they're released outboard the vessel. They don't spend any time on the vessel. And then the viabilities, those are codes that are used by the observer program um, to determine uh, kind of different conditions of those fish. So if they fall into excellent, moderate, poor, or dead. And we've um, come up over the years of studying this um, with discard mortality rates for each of those based largely on um, wire tagging efforts that are also uh, reliant on physical return of those physical recapture and return of that data information which sometimes has um, issues in its interpretation due to different motivations of the fisheries to actually report those tags in so we on all these cases we um, paired on the excellent fish with the satellite tags that uh, Dr. Planos mentioned. So the next slide. So just the initial work on this looked at um, with legals on the left. So those are fish that are 32 inches or greater and sublegal on the right. Those are the fish that are generally being released. They're not allowed to be brought in and, and landed um, by the directed fishery. And um, this just breaks them down into their viability score. Um, you can see that you know, a large portion of the fish generally are released in excellent or moderate condition. Um, but particularly so when you break that down by the release method, um, the majority of fish that are receiving uh, the regulatory releases of careful shake or ganyan cut, um, they make up the lion's share of the excellent quality fish. And then the hook stripper has significantly higher damage. Um, you can see that in both panels, as particularly as the fish are smaller, they're much more susceptible to the higher damage. Uh, next click. And so this was published back in 2022 from Dr. Loredal, and that was the minimum DMR for those excellent fish from the satellite tags is 4.2%, which is in line with the estimates that we currently use from our um, long-term tagging studies. This panel shows you the injury types that are seen by these fish. So these are the things that are contributing largely to um, those um, viability classifications. And um, again, legal fish on the left, sublegals, the ones that are being released on the right. And the majority of fish that are being released by the two regulatory methods, roughly 80% of them have simply a torn cheek, which is essentially the, the, the hooking injury that the animal is actually hooked on. It goes into the mouth and pops out to the cheek around the jaw. 
And um, as you move into the uh, hook stripper, you start to see those kind of indiscriminate injuries where um, you're starting to tear right through the face because it's just mechanically being done. They're not actively trying to be gentle with the fish and shake it back off the hook. They're, they're remarkably good uh, with the gentle shake. Um, you know, the ganyan cut just leaves the hook in there to, to fall out on its own or to um, rust out. And so that's largely just the hooking injury. But even with the gentle shake, it's almost an identical foot fingerprint of injuries. So they're with that gentle shake, they're very good at just getting it to pop back out and not tear and damage the fish's face. Um, next slide. So then looking at the, the stress indicators in the blood across the different viability categories, we didn't see any differences in uh, glucose or cortisol across the different viabilities. They were, there was no distinguishing there. But for lactate and for hematocrit, there was a, a, a significantly higher level uh, in fish categorized as dead. And um, we hypothesize that that's, next click, is related to amphipod intrusions. These fish, when they're on the hook, are prone to being invaded with um, sea lice. So these are fish that, um, sorry, sorry, sand fleas. These are fish, these are amphipods that come in and start to devour the fish while they're trapped at the bottom. And we anticipate that uh, as the animal struggles and is trying to get away from these, the lactate builds up in its system. It doesn't have enough time to clear it. And the, um, the sand fleas also um, reduce the amount of blood in the fish. And you start seeing that in the actual levels that were shown by these fish. Um, do you have, sorry, just backing up on that. Do you have any questions in particular on any of those elements? No. Okay. So these results have been um, submitted to the um, Journal of Ocean and Coastal Management. We can hear back on that. Um, moving into the fishing technology, this is a project we're working on, uh, looking at reducing whale depredation um, by protecting longline catches. And it's been a multiple phase study. We received some funding from the Bycatch Reduction Engineering Program. It's a NOAA fisheries granting uh, group. And the first phase uh, was the first that grant covered the first two phases. The first was an international workshop where we were looking at uh, best ideas to um, really break the reward cycle and depredation and not give the whales any sort of food reward for their efforts. And from that uh, came out two viable approaches. One was an enclosing shuttle, which is like an underwater elevator. I think if you hit next button it'll pop up some images of that so the shuttle's like an underwater cage that slides down the long line and plucks the fish off near the bottom the fish are inside the shuttle it um, as the gear is being hauled it encounters a stopper and the whole shuttle brings all those fish inside of it kind of like an elevator up to the surface the second is the idea of a shroud more or less an umbrella that drops out over the fish and kind of uh, cloaks them or hides them on their trip up to the surface how does that shuttle what do, you do with the hooks to remove it at the clip? So the, the, the shuttle, it slides down the ground line and the fish slide into it and then they're removed. The fish are removed from the, on the inside of the device, more or less like a hook stripper. And then the hook continues on out, out the back end of the device until the device hits the stopper and then it brings it up. So that's one of the things we wanted to look at was, was what, what's the effect on those fish. So phase two is that pilot testing of those devices. And we did that in May of this current year. We wanted to look at deployment and retrieval logistics. This device has been used on a single very large vessel down in Antarctica um, that's specially designed for the devices. And we wanted to demonstrate that the device could actually be used on a smaller uh, size vessel in a safe manner off the vessels that are around involved in our fishery. We wanted to look at optimal configurations for it um, as far as weighting and attachments. So that the shroud device was deployed on a slightly different type of gear called branch line gear, where you have a main line, main ground line or mother line, and then you have branches coming off of it. Um, and those branches, you know, in this case had um, 10 snap hooks that would slide and cluster together as the shroud slid down and covered up any cash that was on them. Um, and so we needed to know the, the best weighting to get those things to go down to the bottom where you're not shrouding them before they've eaten fished, that sort of thing. 
And the, the shrouding um, technique is being used in fisheries right now off Argentina, as well as some in the Mediterranean. They're testing out that sort of gear. And we wanted to look at basic performance um, between treatments and non-treatments. So using the device or not using the device on um, species encountered, the size of the species encountered, the number of species and that sort of thing. So um, if you move to the next slide, so the, the, the shuttle testing, um, the shuttle, there's an image of one on the left. And again, this device is about, um, it's 80%, right? 80% the size of the one that's being used in the Antarctic. So it's a, it's a reduced size one. And you can see we had cameras attached to it on the inside, looking both at the point where the fish are uh, entering the device to see if any were actually being excluded to the outside that we weren't seeing get entrained inside the device. And then another one looking at how the fish are being removed on the inside to see if we get better understanding of uh, the dynamics of that. Um, the device would be hauled up. You can see one coming out of the, the water on the, the third image. And then there's a trap door on it that you open it up and you can see a, a catch that's mostly halibut. And there's a petrali sitting on top pretending to be a halibut. Um, but we demonstrated that you could safely operate it on a much smaller vessel than it's traditionally been used on. There is certainly a, a learning curve to attach it in line during the hauling event. So traditionally, these things have been set with the gear during setting and then they just automatically slide along the gear during haulback. We were actually setting these from the surface. So the idea there is you have a tool that if the whales show up, that you can deploy um, and protect the fish at the bottom. Otherwise, you may not need to use it just to haul normally. Um, we saw similar catch rates to the standard gear between the um, sets that had the device and those that didn't. Um, but there was a definite need to uh, refine Ganyan, the hook size, the ground line to minimize damage to the fish. So we knew that, you know, it was an indiscriminate method to remove the hooks from these fish. And we have, um, and the, the inventor was out on the boat with us. We have several ideas on how to minimize that damage. And we may be able to minimize that damage. We saw a minimization. We moved to a smaller hook, and a lighter Ganyan during the study to just try to mitigate that because the, the damage on the first set was, was pretty unacceptable. But the, the answer might be that, you know, when using the device, you, you decide to bring all the fish in. You have to change the regulation to, to minimize that. So we'll get hopefully better understanding moving forward. Well, Next. Presumably if these are used in uh, sets where whales are present, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about damage relative to whale depredation. Yeah. Right. So, so a damaged fish as opposed to one that's just a head. Or, yeah. 100%. 100%. Yes. Yeah. So you got to put it in context and, and you also have to put it in context that you know, maybe it's better to be removing those small fish rather than putting them out there as leftover popcorn that you're still encouraging the, the whales to stick around. So it might be a situation where that regulation just needs to be tweaked. But while doing the study, we thought we should at least be monitoring that, tracking that for sure, because people are going to ask questions about it. So for the shrouds, we actually um, used a modified slinky pot. So a slinky pot is a collapsible pot that um, was alluded to earlier that the sablefish fleet has largely moved to these. Um, they're a lightweight collapsible pot that's easy for transportation. We didn't use them as a pot. We used them as a shroud. So we cut the end out of one end. We put PVC piping around it to mitigate um, hooking the, the edge of it um, as it went to slide over the, the gear. Um, and we used these variable strength snaps instead of stuck gear so that they would cluster more easily. We did show that the, the shrouds could slide down and cover the hooks um, and, and um, collapse those snaps together. We did get a fair bit of snarling uh, to the, the netting that you see on the side. Effectively though, on this one, we had quite low catch rates. Um, we ended up having to space the gear on two foot centers instead of the 18 or nine foot centers that you'd seen on the uh, on the previous treatment with the shuttles and a lot a lot of that had to do with safety while we were setting this there was some elements that you know designing it on your desktop in the office and then bringing it out with the fishermen they're looking at it going uh well you know we use these extra sections of gear for safety reasons not for other things and we're like oh really and so we had to reconfigure and fly change on the fly while we were out there so effectively we had 10 hooks on 10 on two foot spacing, which is almost like our set line survey is one hook every 18 feet. So it was almost like we were fishing a single hook as far as fishing power went. 
Um, and then we also found that we were in lots of hagfish. So the, we had cameras deployed on these as well to better understand the sinking dynamics, the fishing dynamics, and the haulback dynamics on how the developed, how the unit slid, slid down the gear. There was hagfish all over the place, and that was largely preventing us from getting captures to better see if the gear was properly capturing fish. So the hell that you see on the right was one that was properly captured. All the hook snaps were collapsed together, and it was shrouded. Um, but we didn't get a lot of testing power because we didn't catch a lot of fish on this study. I don't think it was anything about the sets. I think it had to do with where we were located. And, you know, we get up in the morning and there you're, you're, you've got hagfish targeting vessels fishing around you. And we, um, we were able to fish the 18 or nine foot spacing in the same area with the shuttle because we were fishing both gear types on, on different sets of gear at the same time. But that bigger spacing allowed us to actually catch some halibut on the shuttle. But when we were down to one hook in a concentrated spot, once the hagfish found you, they ate all 20 gear hooks very quick. So uh, that part kind of messed with our results to some degree. But we pretty quickly also learned that some of the logistics issues not, not just during haulback, but also during setting, are going to make it difficult to, to kind of um, use this particular one. It would take a lot more work to, to scale this up to a fishery level um, effort. Again, it is being used by other fisheries, but right now we're probably not recommending that we move forward with this particular technique. It also, the shroud also technically leaves an opening at the bottom where if you are catching a bonanza of fish, at some point you're encouraging them to really investigate uh, the whales to really investigate your device and sneak up through the bottom. And right now there's evidence, um, now that the sailfish fleet has moved over to using slinky pots, the whales have moved to sweep. This is the mother and load jackpot of fish and they're tearing the slinky pots open. So they're turning into the, you know, fish pinata uh, effect, which is also not desired. So uh, next slide. So, once we get this written up and we're going through the analysis and some of the we're doing the final data pulls out of the video footage but once we do that and then analyze the data we're um moving on to phase three we just secured uh new brep funding to test the devices actually in the presence of orca whales and so that's phase three a that you see at the top um and again it's going to be uh, pending or permitting uh so yeah, pending permits and vessels, and the permits are going to be a little tricky. The the fishery already sometimes is getting whaled on, um, but trying to actually go out and do a study where you're in the presence of whales is going to be a trickier thing. And um, for those that saw the Seattle Times newspaper yesterday, there's this is becoming a, a bigger issue because the trawl fleet this year has caught a whole bunch of orca in the process of fishing, uh, and it's been rumored for a couple months, but it actually may Pretty big headlines yesterday so we'll see how that affects the permitting phase but assuming we can get permits and a vessel to do the work we certainly have groups interested in the work uh, we're proposing to do 10 days of fishing in the presence of orcas and we would do catch rate comparisons with and without the shuttle device we would not be looking to use the shroud device on this one we'd be looking at some further refinements on um, ease of attachment of the device onto the actively being hauled um, ground line but also looking at some options for the GAN unit hook strength to look at fish damage within the device. And then uh, some of the same catch composition details, looking at size ranges, species being caught, how much volume of fish can you get into the device, those sorts of questions. And then we're also hoping to do a similar test in the presence of sperm whales. Um, we had a pre-proposal in Salt and Stall Kennedy that we um, was discouraged to go forward on, uh, that we found out at the end of last week after the slide was made, but we got some good feedback in the process, so we go to other agencies to try to uh, secure some funding to do that testing as well. Um, to, cut, to get it to a phase where the fishery can use it, um, those sorts of questions are gonna need to be answered in the presence of whales, demonstrating its efficacy and safety, so. Is there any uh, risk that you know of to whales from these devices? Not that we know of. They, they present a large sonar signal to these animals. They're gonna see them coming. Um, and they're sliding down very restricted to the um, ground line itself, like they're, they're, they're riding the ground line down. Um, is there zero risk? No. Uh, is the risk low? I would say it's probably quite low. Um, and uh, if anything, the whales are going to be seeing them and, and 
maybe looking at them. But the, again, we um, we learned a lot from the camera work that we did and the light work that we did. So we hope to refine that further and also look at the behavior of the animals around the device, as well as hopefully have some um, hydrophones around the device to better kind of quantify, you know, what are the whales doing while we're um, testing while we're while we have a test device on or while we were just doing the raw hauling. And then I, I think a bigger component that could come out of that is is further enhancing some of Ian's work on um, what are the what are the rates of fish removal when whales are really present? Because we we think that um, entrainment level with the device is quite high. You know, upper 90 percent of of the fish that are on the gear are getting entrained within the device some of them may be getting flung off the outside but it, it's a low amount most of them get entrained um and then you know if we're in the presence of whales and we do a set with and a set without what kind of catch rate comparisons are we seeing there's it's one thing to, to, to estimate it because there's whales at the surface it's another to, to kind of instrument it and try to better understand that so um, I, I think that's a important factor to point out and to you know get your guys' support on too, that, that is, this is something that could really help with that because that's all been kind of theoretical and, and done by um, assumption. Whereas here we can actually look at those those rates. So, and this is a summary of the, the grants that have been issued to date. The um, latest one that I just announced there for the testing in the presence of whales doesn't kick in until uh, October or November this year. Yeah, and also this slide is to highlight that uh, all of these projects uh, and you know, we also have a North Pacific Research Board uh, funding that covers all the population genomics work. Uh, there's, uh, these are collaborative projects, so we've engaged uh, several uh, partners on these projects. Um, Alaska Fisheries Science Center, different places, Juneau, Seattle, uh, and also some, um, some uh, fishing organizations and industry representatives. And that brings to the end of our presentation. You can take any questions if you have any. Speaking of funding, the MPRB money uh, runs out at some point, right? That's yeah, uh, end of January of 2024. Okay. Is that, what, what do you guys think about that? Is that gonna affect um, any of these ideas moving forward? Well, um, what we're probably going to do is uh, we're going to um, request a six months extension. So we usually grant them, and if we've done that in the past, we don't need. No, I meant the NPRB program. That was, I thought that that NPRB program was something No, no, it's not. That's no. not. Am I getting confused? I thought that was Exxon Valdez money. That, that, uh, no, the uh, the uh, no the NPRB gets its funding from the Department of Commerce, so it's no it's basically NOAA funding. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a that's a separate. Uh, the, the funding for NPRB is not is not anonymous. And we hope to target NPRB for our next round of applications yeah. uh, regarding public genomics. Yeah, that's all for us. Okay, well, you can take uh, a bit of time here to go over some notes and do some drafting. Uh, no, I think that would be for the sending it. I haven't received any. Uh, I think they've mentioned that they might be sending something a bit later, right? He's he sending by email. Oh, he, he might have sent it. So I don't know. Well, it was about the, the steering the, the computer. Oh, okay. not the draft. Yes, I have. It's working. What we can do, we can bring it on the screen. So I can see what. Um, I'm not sure if yeah. Kim is uh, joining the drafting session. Or... Yeah, Kim is going <clears> to. <throat> so. 
Yeah, I think we'll just have the SRB for the rest of the afternoon. Okay. Yes, sure. But do you want that to we can help you with putting the the draft on the screen so that we can sure. see it as well? That's on Facebook too. But if you just forward it then to me oh. and then we can we might want to edit. So Oh, well, you can also just share this. Uh, you can also join the meeting and share uh, share your screen so that we can make it. You have the link to the meeting. It doesn't like joining the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to just take so over have, and uh, yeah, just join the meeting and then share your screen? Is the link on? The I can send it. It's on the website, you have to register. This way, you'll go right in. Boot off all the yeah, there and and um, science advisors too. Yeah, just to just plug you guys in at the thing, but it doesn't work. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, maybe we can. So for so we can also connect the public part of the uh, session, right? So. Thank you very much, everybody joining online. We'll now uh, close the meeting and we'll just move to a, a just a drafting session for SRB members only. And if I could help uh, have a secretariat's uh, help tech support to just shut out the main meeting and keep the the main room for the uh, for the SRB only.